Thank you very much, everybody. Lovely to see you. I've been off a little bit, so it's a real pleasure to, to be back here in the chamber with you. And not as cold as we were expecting. So I've got lots of layers on. I think everybody else has. <laughs> we'll um, manage with that. I hope it doesn't get any colder during the rest of the morning. So good morning, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream. Welcome to this meeting of the Sound Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee. My name's Councillor Pippa Halings, and I'm chair of the committee. Please can those present in the council chamber note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point, and the camera follows the microphone being switched on. So councillors and officers are requested to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. And if the fire alarm sounds, then please leave the chamber and make your way down the stairs, knowing that it's the far beyond stairs, not the stairs here which are closed, and do not use the lift. And the safe assembly point is next to the marketing suite halfway along the business park. And those of you who are participating in the live stream, um, please indicate those of you who are able to wish to speak via the chat column, which will be... Um, our officers who are in that, please do not use the chat column for any other purpose. Um, make sure that your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless you're invited to do otherwise. And please ensure you've switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they don't interrupt the proceedings. And please use a headset if available when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. And when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. And when you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Speak slowly and clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. My vice chair, as always, will be noting who's asking to speak, both within the room and those who are able to speak who are on the live stream. Committee members present in the chamber, I'll now invite each of you to introduce yourselves. And after I call your name, please turn on your, well, on your microphone, wait two seconds, and say your name so that your presence may be noted. So I'm Councillor Pippa Halings, and I'm one of the members for Histon, Impington and Orchard Park. And my vice chair is... Morning, everybody. Councillor Henry Batchelor, one of the members for Linton and vice chair of the committee. Thank you. And Councillor Dr Martin Kahn. Hello, Martin, uh, Martin Kahn, member, one of the members for Histon and Impington and Orchard Park. Thank you very much. Just remember when you press it on, just wait a couple of seconds to then speak so that it's, it's fully in. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, good morning, Chair. Uh, Jeff Harvey, I'm the Councillor for Portion Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Toomey Hawkins, member for Caldicott Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Judith Ripeth. Good morning, Chair. Um, Councillor Judith Ripeth member for Milton and Water Beach Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. I'm Deborah Roberts, and I'm the District Councillor for the Foxton Ward. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Good morning, Chair. Heather Williams, and I represent the Mordens Ward. Thank you very much. And Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for the Whittlesford Ward. Lovely. And Councillor... Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. I'm Councillor Eileen Wilson, member for Cottenham Ward. Thank you. And last but not least, <laughs> Councillor Peter Fane. Good morning, Peter Fane, Shelford Ward. Thank you very much. We also have two officers in the chamber. Um, Nigel Blaisby, delivery manager. Good morning, members. And Stephen Reid. Uh, morning, Chair. Morning, members. Thank you, our senior planning lawyer. <clears throat> if any time a member leaves the meeting, would they please make that fact known to me so that it can be recorded in the minutes? And I intend breaking for 15 minutes at about 11.30. Um, and then if the meeting is still going on at about 3.30. And I also propose we have a 45-minute break for lunch at about 1.15. That's okay with everybody? Thank you. Um, and members, may I check that you have the papers issued for this meeting on the 30th of November and a supplement issued for this meeting as well. You should have received three written statements earlier this week. Can I just confirm that with everybody? Thank you very much. Wonderful. And thank you very much. So, Lawrence, are you with us? 
Morning, Chair. Morning, Chair. So, Lawrence, also just introduce yourselves. You are a very, very important member of this um, committee's proceedings. Yeah, I'm Lawrence Damari Homan, the Democratic Services Officer for Planning. Thank you. You're slightly broken, but that's okay. And um, you help organise the meeting and provide the meetings for it, but also help us with item number two. Apologies, please, Lawrence. So, as far as I'm aware, there are no apologies for absence today. Unless members have any news to the contrary, but it sounds like we're all present. No, it is full house. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item three, declarations of interest. Um, I know some, one of the objectors on the uh, item on Infington Lane, um, and uh, I will also be presenting the local councillor's viewpoint, so I will withdraw from the meeting for that uh, during this uh, discussion and only present my point about the uh, local councillor. Thank you very much. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Uh, yes, I'm the member for Borsham Ward, and therefore I have been present in parish council meetings where uh, item five, the solar farm, has been briefly discussed, but I'll be coming to this afresh. Thank you very much. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, I, on agenda item 11, there's a, an item relating to the Smithy Fen Traveller site in Cottenham, and I'm the member for Cottenham, <coughs> so non pecuniary interest. Thank you very much. And myself, um, also agenda item nine, which is 60 Impington Lane. Um, I've been involved in conversations with parish council about drainage issues for um, the sites around this area and do know also the people who are, will be speaking, um, but have not been in any direct conversation about this with any of the um, developers and the applicants. And I will be obviously be coming to this afresh. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Oh, sorry. Me. <laughs> so, me, Chair. Um, I have an issue, uh, sorry, an interest in item number five. I'm the County Councillor for West Wickham and West Ratting. And so, so to you. Councillor Harvey, I've been present in parish council them. meetings, but I'm coming to this decision afresh. Thank you. And apologies, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm the ward member for uh, Little Branston, item number eight, and I have the parish council's um, authority to give a brief statement on their behalf because they can't be here today. Ah, so on, on item number eight. eight. And I have not been present at any of the discussions on the issue. So you'll be speaking out for reading out the parish councils then? Just a, a statement, uh, a short. From them? A statement from them. Good, okay. Thank you very much. And Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, for completeness, Chair, agenda item 12, one of the appeals is in Steeple Morden, and that's an application that I have been involved in. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you, everybody. We'll move on to agenda item four, which are the minutes. And these are the minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of November. To find in our agenda pack from page one. Do you have any comments on the minutes? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, so could I have an affirmation then that we take um, these minutes, except for myself, because I will abstain because I was not present. But can we take by affirmation everyone else in the chamber that they accept the minutes? Two of us abstaining. Everyone else agreed? Thanks very much. Great. <coughs> Thank you. We'll start with agenda item five, which is on page 50. <laughs> Do you want to resolve it in the break? <laughs> Shall we resolve it in the break, I think? Agenda item five on page 15. And... This is for application 20 slash 01564 slash full um, application. This is for Bolsham Ward in West Rotting, Par Rotting Parish, land to the south east of Burton End, West Wickham. The proposal is for mixed use of agricultural and so land and solar farm. The key material considerations are the principle of development, renewable energy, heritage assets, natural assets, agricultural land, 
character and appearance of the countryside, landscape character, neighbour amenity, highway safety and flood risk. Um, it's not a departure from policy, which I think it is. I will check. No, it's not a departure. And the application has been brought to committee because of the um, level of local interest. Presenting officer, Karen Hill-Coggins. Are you with us, Karen? I am indeed. Thank you very Morning. much. Morning. Hi there. Um, thank you, Chair. So I have a small verbal update for the application. The agent has submitted a representation earlier this week, which has been circulated to members. Um, can you just please confirm that you have all seen that representation? Thank you. We already confirmed that, Karen. Thank you. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. So um, just to confirm, the applicant is Mr. David Lodge, and Mr. Lodge has submitted a number of media articles in relation to the following um, issues. The need for renewable energy, generally, the lack of renewable energy in the UK, Alternative power would be potentially via electricity pylons, which would have a greater impact on the landscape. Um, need for biodiversity, livestock farming and solar farms, and the need for a local supply of renewable energy. I have one additional representation has been received from property at 53, the common West Ratting basically um, reiterates a lot of the concerns that are set out in the report, um, specifically in relation to the loss of high quality agricultural land, the adverse impact upon the landscape, the setting of heritage assets, um, no provision for decommissioning of the site, and that the developers have not engaged effectively with the local community. Also, some concerns were raised with regards to highway safety. So I will go on to my presentation now. So bear with me a second. <clears throat> can you just confirm that you can see the presentation, please? Yes, thank you very much. OK, great. So this is an application for mixed use of an agricultural solar farm. The site is located outside of the West Ratting and West Wickham Village frameworks. So the site is represented by the red star in the middle. West Ratting is up here to the northwest. West Wickham is down here to the southwest. So the connection point for the solar farm is here which is about 300 metres to the northeast of the site. So just on the larger scale plan there, you can see the connection point. Um, so let's go on, just an aerial photograph that shows the extent. So again, West Wickham is down here, West Ratting a little bit further up to the northwest. Um, these buildings here are large um, former RAF hangars. Um, obviously a lot of arable land surrounding it and then you've got this is Burton End which comes towards West Wickham, the Common which goes towards West Ratting, um, Common Road which goes towards Carlton and Skipper's Lane which heads towards Withersfield so the site is just here. So just to show you some photographs of the site so this is the site from the junction of Burton End, the Common Common Road and Skipper's Lane. So the extent of site you can see is the area of grassland and scrub. <clears throat> and then there's views of the site. So this first one is from, so this is a longer distance view from Burton End in West Wickham. And the site is to the right hand side of that road. And this is a bit of a closer viewpoint um, with the site being just here, you can see the building, um, the one of the RAF hangers here. It's going on further. This is the view from Common Road from West Ratting. Again, firstly, a longer distance view. So the site would be here. And then a more closer view with the site here. <clears throat> 
the area of the site is in on grade two agricultural land which this is a map showing the agricultural land classification in the district the site is over here where the red star is and as you can see that's in, in the area of the light blue which is very good agricultural land the green is the good to moderate agricultural land and then red is the urban areas um, yellow is the poor quality agricultural land so the site lies in the South Suffolk and North Essex Clayland National Land, excuse me, National Character Area in landscape terms. The site measures 1.8 hectares in area and it would comprise 4,580 4, solar panels. It would be for a temporary period of 25 years. It provides one megawatt of renewable energy to power approximately 650 local homes. Landscaping would comprise native species hedgerow, hedgerows around the perimeter of the site and grass and wildflowers on the site. The agricultural land would be grazed by sheep. Access to the site is off Burton End, West Wickham, which is just here. And then as you come into the site, you would have the two substations which one would be the district network operator substation and one would be the client substation. And those buildings are the highest is 3.5 metres. Um, the other is 2.9 metres in height. And then this central area has an inverter, which is 2.4 metres in height, with the solar panels being 2.5 metres in height. <clears throat> The key material considerations to consider in the determination of the application are the principle of development in terms of renewable energy, heritage assets, natural assets, agricultural land, character and appearance of the countryside, landscape character, neighbour amenity, highway safety and flood risk. Um, just to go on, so you have got these in your plans pack this information and the policy is there if we need it during the course of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. And I'm sure there'll be some questions as we move into the debate time. Um, we don't have anybody who is um, down to speak as an objector, but we do have the applicant um, agent, which is Linda Walker. Do we, are you here? <coughs> yes, yes, I'm here. Can you see Hello, me? Hello, Miss Walker. Um, Hello. Yes, so you have three minutes to help you know the protocol. Yes, yes. I do. <laughs> Thank you yes. very much. Um, and so we'll, so we'll start the time office. now, and um, and I think Nigel, you will be helping me with the, the timing. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. That's okay. No, thank you for the opportunity to um, speak, and um, good morning to you members. Um, I, I did send an email on Friday um, because I'm conscious that I only have three minutes. So I think um, I just wouldn't mind um, just speaking about the really um, for the, the two reasons of refusal um, based on the, the time period that I have. Um, so firstly, um, the solar farm, as, <clears throat> as mentioned by the officer, um, will give um, provide green energy for up to 650 homes. Um, and also assisting um, in meeting the targets, the zero uh, carbon targets for 2050. Um, the re reason one, um, officers are talking about the landscape impacts. Um, <coughs> and just to clarify, we did actually submit a, a landscape visual impact assessment, <coughs> which, um, <coughs> sorry, which confirms that there would be low to moderate impact. Um, and um, the main impact during um, would be mainly during construction. Um, the, um, we have also provided a um, comprehensive landscape scheme, which has been included, and we've also included the biodiversity scheme within that as well. Um, so we've looked at, you know, we've looked at reducing the impacts as, as much as possible. Um, with reason two, um, um, that makes um, quite a lot of um, uh, uh, statements to the ministerial statement um, and it's, it's given it significant weight in the report, the officer report. Um, 
I just would like, like to mention, I, I believe the statement is actually rather outdated, um, to be honest, um, given the fact that we have um, now a new target to meet um, for 2000, uh, 2050. Um, it has been given some significant weight, um, this, the ministerial statement talking about the loss of agricultural land. Firstly, um, this land hasn't been farmed for, I think it's 25 years. Um, and uh, in the officer report, it suggests that, you know, um, grazing isn't actually characteristic of the area. It's more of an arable type of um, farming. However, the planning system doesn't actually have control on farmers and on what they actually farm and, and how they treat their land. Um, we will be grazing sheep um, as to, to bring it back into an agricultural use. Um, and also going back to the ministerial statement, um, if members you know, do decide to give it the same weight as officers have, um, the, the statement does actually talk about, um, you know, that they they would like to keep agricultural land. As I said, we're actually enhancing the area because we're actually bringing the site back into an agricultural use. Um, but the statement also talks about diversity schemes, and it's it actually says in there that well, you can actually solar farms can be approved if they actually if we're going to um, provide a, a biodiversity scheme as we have. Um, so the, there is no loss of land. Um, agricultural land for this development. That's your three minutes if you've got a, yeah. Three okay, minutes. all right, thank you. Thank you very much. And we, there is an opportunity for questions if anybody does um, have any questions for you. Okay. Councillor Deborah Oates. Thank you, Chairman, and through you, Chairman. Um, I wonder if you could tell me, um, you talk about um, it would have a newer agricultural use in the um, that you had livestock on it. Uh, however, I think I read through the pages that uh, livestock in that area is not a commonplace thing. It's, it's mainly a, 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 feed, a food rather than animals. Um, can you tell me how many um, animals, sheep, you seem to be intending putting on there? And can you tell me, do you know of any other examples where locally, where on uh, these sort of solar farms, sheep are actually grazing yeah um firstly i haven't actually got a a number i'm sure i probably have and it's in in the email trails to the officer um but that, that we will, will be grazing sheep um my my client has actually um approached a number of people to um see if that would be an opportunity and yes it is um and the there is a mixed use application um that was approved in norfolk not quite as local as maybe you'd, you'd hoped, um, but that scheme um, was approved um, and that has also been sent to, um, the details have been sent to the um, officer during the process of the application. Um, and that, that was approved and the condition was imposed to say that, basi you know, basically the development of the solar farm couldn't go ahead unless sheep were grazed constantly actually at, at the, on the site. wondering why the land had been left uncultivated in an area of very pri prime agricultural land uh, for, for 25 years. Was it set aside? What was the reason why it was left um, Okay, left um, again, the officers have been made aware of this um, during the process of the application. Um, it, it's, it's something to do with, um, so that the land was owned apparently by one farmer um, many, many years ago. Um, and due to um, a death in the family, um, the land was parceled off. Um, and this small parcel was actually just given given at, but through the will and everything, through, um, just to, to one person in the family. Um, it's not part of the wider agricultural um, setting, or uh, sorry, in, in the parcels of the actual farming for the larger farm area. It's just one, one parcel that's been left over almost. Uh, and is this person who then, who presumably is now responsible for it, uh, able to um, manage the farming? How would the farming be managed? Would it be managed by this individual with a small plot of land or would it be managed as part of a larger farm? 
it, I, it would be, I, well, it's actually we're talking about specialised sheep on there, so it would be actually farmed by that by that individual on that on that field. Um, but I know that the client has actually spoken to local farmers in the area, and there, there would be a there is a potential need for grazing in the area. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. So uh, a couple of questions through yourself, Chair. One of which is um, the there has been a request around the construction vehicles and looking at the access and how narrow those lanes are. Normally, if you see solar farms, they do tend to be a size sort of dual carriageways or main major roads. So I'm just wondering if it's possible to to actually not have HGVs. I'm a, I'm sort of just trying to assess the equipment that's going to be used and whether it's possible or not to use smaller vehicles. The other thing is going to going into sheep farming. Um, you can't just have one piece of land to graze. There has to be rotation in the grazing. There has to be periods for it to be left. There's, there's all sorts of reasons why you would need to, to do it. So how many other sites will there be, or is this, if it's being outsourced? I say this is if it's going to, if there's not a local supply, um, you know, or alternatives, then I'm sorry, it's just a solar farm because you can't practically graze because you have to have rotation in them. Um, so, so I'm responsibly informed. <laughs> um, would you like me to comment on that? Sorry, yes, I'm please sure do. That directed yeah, me. Thank you. Um, so with regard, and again, through the process of the application, um, we have um, I've submitted some details to the officer to say that we would be using, um, you know, just vans um, for the construction purposes. And as we're all aware, um, you know, the vehicle generation for solar farms is almost nil, um, you know, while, while they're kind of um, in, in operation. Um, in regards to the sheep farming, um, there, there, there is other land available. Um, and yes, there would be a rotation of, of different sheep onto the land. Um, that was something that we could investigate further. Um, but looking at the evidence um, for the approval in, in Norfolk, um, the sheep farming does actually work very well against um, a, a, with the solar farm use. And Thank that's you. the based our application. Thank you. The follow up from that research. Thank you. Um, so, so two things, two things, Chair. Uh, one is on, you know, references to Norfolk, I think, and we're being asked to look at sort of the energy efficiency and, and everything else. But if you're transporting sheep from that a farm, you know, we want to know that there is more available sites to have sheep, I'd have thought, in the vicinity. Um, and you can't, you can't just swap the sheep. It has to have rest periods. Um, so it's not a case of bringing in different types. It's a case of actually the majority of time that land will not be able to be grazed on just through the shear cycles and the license requirements of having livestock. Um, the other thing is, what sort of water demand do we think that this solar farm will will actually require? Because those of us with solar farms in our patches know that quite often um, a, a standpipe comes in and, and a lot of water in the summer months actually for cooling processes is required. Thank you. So there, there's an additional question on there. So it's coming back on, on the details of the sheep, just to clarify whether those sheep are coming from Norfolk, but also it's not just, it's about the sort of, the condition you mentioned was talking about constant sheep grazing, you mentioned, but as Councillor Heather Williams has said, it, there's actually got to leave the land to rest as well in between periods, so if you could address that. Secondly, just where would the sheep be coming from? Um, and thirdly, um, the issue about water usage, water demand. If you'd like to, to respond on those ones. Oh, sorry. OK, sorry. Yes. Um, no, the, when, when I made reference to the farming in Norfolk, that was actually um, that was actually a, just a, an example of an application that has actually been approved. That's not part of the farming that we're proposing here. Um, the, the farming that would be specialised sheep um, and it may be that they they wouldn't the sheep wouldn't be on the um, land constantly. Um, I could do, you know, need to do some more research for you to, to give you that information. Um, but as I said, the, they will be on the, they are actually proposed to be on the uh, land for grazing. Um, with regard to um, the water supply, that's something that I'm not aware of, if I'm really honest. 
Um, we have submitted a drainage scheme, um, a flood risk assessment, um, a, com a comprehensive one at that, um, and, and we haven't had any issues raised from um, the LNFA um, that they've actually removed their objection um, for any issues relating to water or flood risk or anything. The flooding, I think the question was around water supply and the water demand in um, hotter times for the for the panel. So as I was hearing, you're not, you don't have an answer for that one. At the no, I, I don't have an answer for yeah. that, no, sorry. Good. Um, it's myself, I have a question for you. Um, and that's in the report, there is a question about whether or not there was sufficient evidence provided of having looked for other potential sites in the area. Could you just explain um, a little bit about that? Yeah, OK. So um, the, the officers, as I, I think, as I explained, the, the, based on the ministerial statement um, from Eric Pickles, um, that was, I think it was 2015, that was published. And that asked for compelling evidence if you're going to use agricultural land. Um, one of, well, look, we've, the officer and myself have had quite a lot of discussion about this. Um, and as, I, as I've said, um, the ministerial statement is, is quite outdated, for one, um, talking about compelling evidence requirements. Around the evidence that you provided having looked at other sites. So not the ministerial yes. statement, but the yes. other sites that you'd looked at and found um, this not to be suitable. OK, well, the, well, the other sites, I mean, the other sites we've looked at, uh, we, we've, we've had a look at brownfield sites, um, but the brownfield sites are generally very, very close to um, uh, residential areas, which will cause amenity issues. Um, and, and this site was was picked mainly because of that. We, we haven't found any sites that would be suitable. So can I just go back to, we have on page 33, um, paragraph 72, and I did see that, you know, you were saying that a lot of that brownfield was, was adjacent and close to population, um, but it said that there is an area of grade three agricultural land considered suitable for such development, um, evidence by permission being granted for a solar farm there. So that particular area within six kilometres of the grid connection point to the east of the A11 and west of the village, there's an area of grade three. Do you know that site that's been referred to? No, I don't know. OK, thanks very much. And I have Councillor Jeff Harvey. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I haven't actually been able to find the exact reference here, but um, uh, Karen L. Coggins touched on it earlier. Um, the um, idea that um, this would reduce uh, future need for overhead pylons. Is, is that part of um, what you're kind of arguing? I, I, I just um, would sort of query that because I'm, my, my understanding is that um, uh, all of these um, kind of schemes actually end up with a, with a greater sort of requirement for grid connection capacity, if you like, because um, in an ideal world, I suppose the solar farm would provide local houses and then diminish the need for energy to be brought in from outside. But in reality, the sun doesn't always shine. So it's the, the kind of aggregate, aggregate effect is that you need more connection rather than less. Mm. I, there, I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that there would be more um, need for any pylons. And um, gen, gen, all the evidence that I've found from my research um, would suggest that actually the solar farm are, you know, are efficient and are supplying the energy that requirements and hope and hopefully meeting the targets to 2050. Um, I haven't have I haven't got that information, unfortunately, sorry. And Councillor Peter Fain. Thank you, Chair. My question relates to the prospect of this very small block of agricultural land being brought back into arable production were the solar farm not to go ahead or during the, after the life of the solar farm. Um, is, is it likely that neighbouring arable farmers would, in the absence of the solar farm, be able to take this back in, or because of the location of the site, could that only be done by for instance, hedge removal. I haven't seen the site. Uh, usually we would visit it first, but we haven't 
this time. Um, how likely is it that this could be brought, brought back into arable production in the absence of uh, the soda farm? Thank you. Could you answer that question? So, sorry, I, I, I yeah. I'll the question was uh, about how you know when we're talking about the decommissioning of this, and there would be a condition around the reversion, reversal of this to its agricultural um, use category. Yeah. So the question is, um, how likely do you see? How possible is it? Do you see for that to go back into active agricultural use? Yes, well, uh, again, um, the, the, temp the consent would be for 25 years. Generally, it's a temporary consent. Um, we, have, we have actually, um, my, my client has actually um, had a decommissioning agreement in place, um, and, and that's kind of part of the standard. I think the question is more how likely is it? So, Peter, sorry, go on. Yeah. Councillor Peter Payne. Chair, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear in my question. My question was, if the solar farm were not to go ahead, how practical is it for this small area of prime agricultural land to be brought back into arable production? Are there obstacles to that? Perhaps hedgerows between there and neighbouring land or similar obstacles? I, I don't think there are any obstacles to, to actually have the land brought back into arable or, or grazing agricultural land, no, in the future. I don't think there are any more questions. So thank you very much for your time and for answering all those questions. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Members, before we go, um, move on to the debate section because we have no other speakers lined up. Um, does anyone own vehicle YP11XCL? I think it's blocking something. You know, so don't blame us if it gets towed away. <laughs> Good. Oh. Heather would like to speak. Um, we'll move into the debate. Um, <coughs> Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. So I think I think we um, all can see there is a balance to be made. Obviously, we want more renewable energy and all these sorts sorts of things. Um, however, I I do also have concerns around the loss of of the agricultural land. So I'm just going to read what grade two is. It's very good quality agricultural land. This land has minor limitations which affect crop yield, cultivations or harvesting. And I say that because we also need to look at food security and, and there's no point having solar farm, farms and renewable energy if we're then having to ship food in from further, further fields. So there is a balance to be struck. I also do have concerns around that we don't have any clarity of what the water demand can be because solar farms can be extreme, put extreme pressure onto water supply. And as we know from other areas, you know, we're, we are in danger of becoming water stressed here if we're not already. So I think um, that, um, that also gives, gives cause for concern. Um, we've heard from the applicant that there are no obstacles into actually bringing this it back into prime agricultural use. Mm. In, at which point, um, then I have to say that this is obviously a commercial choice for them to go down. Um, for myself, I am in agreement with officers. Members know this isn't always the case. Um, but in this case, um, I am. I think there are opportunities for solar farms in this area um, or for better renewable energy. Given this location as well, I do think the we should give significant weight to the landscape officers approach. I, I did reference that normally solar farms are near um, near sort of dual carriageways and things like that. That also is about access. You know, there will need to be access to this. Um, and, you know, sometimes equipment you know, does require certain certain issues. If it also if it is going to have cattle there at some period, it cannot, it cannot for their licensing be constant. To, to clear that matter, um, you know, you will you will have traffic in relation to that, and traffic attending daily to tend to them, and water for the water troughs, and, and everything else that comes with it. So, um, so while I do accept there are merits, and I'm not opposed to, to solar farms in South Cairns at all, in this location, um, and on the information we have in front of us, I I'm agreeing to the officer for refusal, chair. 
Good. And what I'm noting, therefore, um, in terms of that planning balance, which you've laid out, I think, so clearly, Councillor Heather Williams, is that the main reasons for you would be the loss of the, the best and most versatile agricultural land, but also there are some environmental considerations in terms of water demand, because the information is not available to be able to make a decision around that. Um, and then you have um, the issue around transport implications, HGV implications. Councillor Judith Rippers. Um, Councillor Williams has stolen my thunder, and I also agree that we should refuse this application because I don't really believe from the, what the applicant's been say, saying that they've really looked closely enough at uh, alternative sites which are not prime agricultural land. That's my main reason. So again, it's that loss of agricultural yeah, land. Yeah, we have to bear, you know, bring that into the balance. Thank you very much. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I have nothing further to add, really. This, these were my concerns as well. But so no. what, I, what I would suggest to everybody, members, is we've got here one of the key reasons for refusal that I'm hearing is the same as we have on page 36, which is the offer's a recommendation for refusal about the loss of the best and most versatile agricultural land. Whilst everyone recognises that we've got a climate emergency, we've got net zero targets, but it's where these are. And, and I welcome the fact that we've got this discussion here because it's this balance again that we're trying to seek. Um, so can I just say, so if you do speak, please try and, it, can it be for other issues? Because they're not about the loss of agricultural land, just to see if we've got additional reasons. Councillor Heather Roberts. Uh, Heather Roberts. <gasps> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, uh, just a different one. I agree with what everybody has said prior to it, but I think we also need to flag up um, the effect on the countryside, the visual effect as well, which is in um, uh, Mrs. Pelcoggin's uh, report here, but I think that is one that also I'm worried about. It's very much in the open countryside and it would be very um, different uh, in an adverse way, I think. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. So that's the second key reason. Councillor Peter Payne. Chair, sure. um Two reasons. I'm, I'm afraid I am going to mention the loss of agricultural land, a different aspect, because as the applicant made clear, this land would not be lost to agriculture, it would be partially used for a different type of agriculture. However, I do place, as Councillor Williams said, very high importance on food security. In this case, I was inclined to think this piece of land is too small for practical arable production on its own. However, the, I was reassured by what the agent said that it would be possible to restore it to arable land, so I, I regard that as dealt with. My principal concern, however, is landscape, and the statement by the landscape officer, which is at page 21, disagreed with the applicant's assessment on the landscape impacts, and I think given the nature of this site and its adjacent to what is referred to as common land, uh, or the common, um, it, it is important to respect the landscape and I don't think that this is a suitable site for even such a small solar farm. Councillor Dr Martin Khan. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to disagree for a change. <laughs> um, I, I was uh, felt that I needed to go and visit the site because I'd, uh, from the report, I couldn't really g gather what the site was like. Um, and I went out, it's a very large open area. The flat area, um, you would hardly see the farm from uh, and most viewpoints. Um, it was a very small feature. It's not high. It's only maximum height, what's it, 2.5 meters for one minor item, and most of it's 2.5 meters, which hedgerows roundabout will probably be similar. Um, I felt there was a large hangar nearby, which is a much more industrial, quite an industrial looking building. I didn't feel that this was going to create a major impact on the landscape. I felt I didn't really feel I could justify the landscape impact. In terms of the agricultural land, uh, I agree the need to defend agricultural land. Basically, what you are saying is we don't want the agricultural... It's been said that the land could be restored to agriculture at the end of 25 years. So you're saying we don't want it to be lost for 25 years. That's, that's the argument. It's not that it's permanently lost. It's going to be used on a mine, in a low-intensity way for 25 years. I can see the argument for using sheep. It keeps the grass down. It prevents um, vegetation from obscuring the panels. Um, I feel that's a viable use. Um, you know, we're not allowed to really consider the ownership. 
but uh, that's not a consideration. The question is whether, but the question is whether it will be used. It clearly has not been used for the last 25 years. It's not been contributing to agricultural production. Um, we cannot impose land ownership either. So we, uh, we, we have to assume that the situation is going to remain the same. Uh, in this situation, I cannot see, if it's not being used the last 25 years, I cannot see it being used likely in the next 25 years. So I don't really see that it's going to make any difference for agricultural production. In a sense, it's going to be a slight amount of production. Um, I, I, I can see that the uh, use for, uh, for sheep is potentially viable has problems, it may not be in practice, but we can see that it's a potential viable, and that's all I really think that I need to do in planning terms, consider. So there is a benefit, it's not a very large benefit from the solar farms, there is a benefit from the solar uh, renewable energy production. There appears to be a connection point relatively near, which is, un which is a big consideration with solar farms, but many, many sites you can't produce. Uh, and the, uh, so the, that means the question of water, and I see that's a, uh, a big, question because solar farms uh, are panels that are above 25 degrees, their production rate goes down. So presumably it's used to use production. Um, I, I don't see why we can't impose conditions to restrict its use and prevent its being, uh, water being used to cool them down. It just, it's a slight loss of production, but I don't see any real principle why we can't do that. So I don't see that as actually a reason um, why we should refuse it. We just have to accept there's a slightly lower production at the peak times when it's more likely to be a surplus of uh, less valuable okay. energy in any case. So, so I've come around to the conclusion that, in fact, I, I'm not sure that I think there are reasons to refuse it, and mm -hmm. I, I shall be supporting it. Thank you. Very good. This is what we're here for. Councillor... Yes. Me. Um, <laughs> so, yes, and, and what I just want to say is I've been on several... Um, webinars and courses at the moment around solar farms and so I would just like to bring into the debate that I saw very seriously that there are solar farms, agro photovoltaics that we're talking about now where you can bring this in too. There are examples where there is grazing together with biodiversity on the site to so making the site much much more productive together with solar panels so it doesn't become a desert with photovoltaics on top. It's integrated into biodiversity and some kind of agricultural use. That's just as a principle. Um, however, for me, I don't think there's enough evidence that we've looked at the, the best site for this. Um, and so I think there's lacking information to provide the evidence that of all the sites, this is um, the best and only one. And I would um, therefore support the issue around the loss of agricultural land. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Um, what I think the committee might expect, I would, I, I would normally um, be very much in favour of um, any sort of uh, renewable energy and generation, but I, it kind of um, begs a question, you know, how do we appreciate the countryside? And, and I suppose you have to accept that actually a lot of people, uh, even because of Perhaps um, you know they're, they're not physically able to appreciate the countryside um, from our sort of highways and byways, if you like. And I think this is actually a very sort of prominent location uh, within the group of villages um, which uh, it's in the midst of. Um, and therefore, um, you know, I, I, I think I think um, it will have a quite a large visual impact, and not, not only that, but it will be an impact that a lot of local residents will be um, seeing kind of, you know, two or three times a day. Um, and, and so I, and I suppose the other question they might ask themselves is, um, you know, I, I, I can see that there's a hierarchy of um, suitability for these sorts of sites, if you like, you know, and that uh, one should be accessing the least damaging sites first before moving on to perhaps the more problematic ones. And I suppose a lot of residents might be asking themselves, well, um, those two large um, former hangars, for example, don't appear to have any um, solar panels on their roof and that that might be um, the first place that one should look um, in, in a sort of hierarchy. So I, I'm afraid I, I think that um, this isn't the best site and 
although I'm, I'm kind of agreeing with the landscape um, assessment, um, I can hope I'm adding a particular angle on that. So I, I think um, I would not be supporting this because I think at this stage there are certainly better sites available. Thank you very much. I think members, having heard everything, we're about to be able to move to the vote. And I'd like to check with um, Nigel about the reasons for refusal, if there were, if that were to be the res result. Uh, thank you, Chair. So the reasons for refusal, I, I believe, are as set out in the, in the report. There was debate around um, lack of information around um, water supply, but I, I, I'm content that from the debate, the two reasons are, are what we're putting forward as officers. Thank you. Which we would find members on page 38 in terms of the planning balance and conclusion and um, the reasons for refusal that were laid out, which is in paragraph 109. It was result in the loss of the best and most versatile agricultural land and also adversely affect the character and appearance of the countryside. Um, but we do welcome, in general, renewable energy and solar panel <laughs> applications. And I know the case office has been involved in many of those in our district. So let's go to the vote. Members, is that fine, Stephen? Chair, I just... Um, you may want to invite members to have a discussion as to whether they feel they should address conditions where they might to approve. I don't think so. Thank you very much. So I think we'll move forward to the vote. So the vote would be... Um, to I you know, approve the officer's recommendation, agree with it, which is to recommend that the planning committee refuse the application and with the reasons which are given on pages 38 and 39. Thank you, members. You're voting, if you vote yes, that is to agree with the officer's recommendation as usual. If you vote no, you are voting against the officer's recommendation. Is that one question mark? I've got one question mark. Someone hasn't voted. Oh, that's you. Sorry. Um, thank you. Members, so that's um, with nine votes to two, um, this is refused. Thank you very much. We move to agenda item six on page 41. This application 21 slash 03607 slash um, full application for land at Baybrum Research Campus in Baybrum. The proposal is for the erection of a new building for office research and development to use and associated infrastructure and works. The applicant is Baybrum Research Campus um, and the key material considerations as, are as on page 41 and I'm sure the case officer will um, outline as well. Um, is this a departure from policy? Yes, as advertised. And the application is being brought to committee because if approved, the application would represent a significant departure from approved policies of the council being a major development in the green belt. Um, and officer recommendation is approval. The presenting officer is Michael Sexton. Are you with us, Michael? I am, good morning, Chair. Good morning. Um, and thank you very much, Michael. Okay, um, I don't have any updates for the update report that you would have seen other than just to to say members would have seen an email circulated by uh, Lawrence and Demographic Services yesterday uh, that contained a letter of support from the Chief Executive of Bayfront Research Campus Limited, but I believe that's been circulated to everyone. Um, so I'll move straight to my presentation. If you could confirm that you're seeing the presentation on the screen, please, Chair. Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so yes, this is a uh, full planning application at uh, Baben Research Campus for a new office slash research and development building with associated infrastructure and works. Um, the site is located within the existing research campus and this part of land here, which marks on the area of photography is here and you can see the existing research campus buildings. Um, in terms of constraint, mainly the reason the application is before members today. The application site is located entirely within the green belt, which is a, a green wash that covers this entire um, screen. Appreciate it doesn't come across too clearly. Um, you have Bayroom Conservation Area to the south of the site, 
um, up of listed buildings, the, the grade one listed church, and then the Bayroom listed Bayroom Hall itself. And as you can see, a small part of the site is located within flood zones two and three, although the built form of development is not located in these areas. It's just for context of the area is a fairly recent aerial view of the site from the design access statement. The application site is this parcel of land in here between the recently developed R&D2 development at Baden Research Campus. So the new building is proposed in this space here as shown on this site plan. So these are those two existing buildings that you could, you could see and the new proposed research and development building located to the south. In terms of appearance, it will take on um, a very similar appearance to the exi two existing buildings while sort of having its own architectural spin just to set it apart slightly from the um, existing buildings. And this is uh, elevations taken across the site which show how the, build, the proposed building um, shown here would sit in the context of the two existing buildings either side. Ground level slope to the south, so it would sit slightly below the height of the existing buildings and, and sit quite nicely within the context of the, the site and the landscape of the area. Um, just a few nice visuals to show you the building. So this is the proposed front elevation of the new building. Um, this is a visual of how the building again would sit between the two existing buildings retaining this central area of, of landscaping and open space where people can spill out and it has this communal effect on the, the research and development and how everything works within the campus. And similarly, looking um, a view northwest of how the building would sit and relate to the existing buildings as well as the rest of the campus. And um, uh, quite a lot of material considerations as set out in, in re report. Um, on the whole, the, the application complies um, with national and local policy um, in most of these respects. The key issue is obviously the fact that it is a, a Greenbelt site. Um, so the MPPF sets out that inappropriate development is by definition harmful to the Greenbelt and should not be approved except in very special circumstances. Uh, paragraphs 149 and 150 of the MPPF set out development that should not be regarded as inappropriate, but the research and development building would not align with any of those. So the proposal does constitute inappropriate uh, inappropriate development by definition. So it's therefore necessary to consider whether the development um, results in any further harm in addition to that by, caused by inappropriateness. As you'll see set out in the report, the only other harm identified is an impact on the openness of the Greenbelt by virtue of introducing a new built form, albeit arguably infilling between two existing buildings. That degree of loss of openness can't be denied. Um, and it's therefore necessary to consider the justification put forward to support the proposal and the extent to which those matters amount to very special circumstances, either taken individually or collectively. Um, and MPBF again is clear that um, substantial weight should be given to, to any harm to the Greenbelt and very special circumstances will not exist unless the harm is clearly outweighed. And as set out in the report, officers do feel that the very special circumstances do clearly outweigh the harm to the green belt, the harm being the inappropriate development and some loss of openness. But the very special circumstances in this instance is, is the need for additional research and development space that's been clearly set out within the application um, and relevant supporting documents. It's a very successful um, campus that's seeking to, to expand um, significant economic benefits. There's 114 permanent jobs associated with this building and an economic assessment estimates at least 5.74 million pound net effect on, on the area. Uh, biodiversity benefits, the development would deliver a 32% biodiversity net gain, which obviously aligns with a very um, hot topic at the moment. Um, so they, those three factors officers are giving significant weight to. There are environmental sustainability benefits in terms of the building being Brian excellent, um, a 30.3% carbon reduction or a 41% reduction with SAP 10 um, and social and health benefits in terms of how the, the research campus operates and how that sector of work operates with the exemplary working science community officers give moderate weight to those factors. So overall officers consider there are very special circumstances to outweigh the harm. Clearly it's for members to form their own view today, but the recommendation is one of approval. Thank you, Chair. Michael, and we'll come back to um, questions, I'm sure. Um, we have 
nobody speaking as an objector, but we do have the applicant, Derek Jones. Are you with us? Oh, there's a written submission. Ah, yes, sorry, thank you very much. So we all did, we just confirmed at the beginning of this meeting that we did receive that written submission. We've all received, yes? Good. Um, and so therefore we don't actually have any public speakers, so we will go straight to, um, straight into the debate. Thank you very much. Councillor Peter Payne. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's only one issue that I want to pursue here, which is the question of the very special circumstances and the extent to which that may outweigh the harm to the Greenbelt. Um, the question of openness is quite difficult to interpret, of course, uh, as Michael Sexton said, um, that is to some extent offset by this being between existing buildings. It wasn't clear to me from the site plans the extent to which this is between existing buildings. It seems to me it does, it is to some extent a new incursion into the green belt, um, in which case the, the extent of the harm to the green belt would be rather greater. Um, so I'm still weighing that in the balance. So and Michael, do you have anything in, in terms of your slide pack there that would give a more of an insight into that, the issue of you said as it, it can't be denied that there is some impact on the openness, but you said it's mm. between the buildings, but it can't be denied. Is there any way of, because we haven't been able to have site visits, is there any way that you can share uh, it again yeah. from your slide pack or any other view? Um, I can, re I made the mistake of closing my presentation, so bear with me and I'll reshare some of the drawings from, from that. Um, just... So hopefully you can see this is the aerial photo of the existing site layout. Um, the new building will be sited here, so slightly to the south of the existing buildings, but sort of forming this, this U-shaped um, group of, of buildings, as you can see here. So it, it's not, I suppose, the infilling is in it's directly in the middle, um, but clearly it forms part of that, that building. And in terms of openness, clearly it's, it's a new built form. So the loss of openness is, inevitable um it's then a matter i think of in, interpretation i know in the planning statement um it was sort of cited as being limited localized loss of openness and i think that's when you take it within the context of the campus and the existing buildings um so this isn't a singular new building in the middle of nowhere in the green belt um so it's it's, it's a matter of judgment i suppose on how much weight you want to give to impact on openness but clearly there is a loss of openness because as it as it currently stands there's no building here um and there is a building proposed you, you know we had the same arguments i think there was an outline application in 2014 um for these two buildings so again it's the same issue with openness as it is each time but there is a loss of openness um but when you take all the factors that weigh in favour of the proposal, I think that that harm is is clearly outweighed in the view of officers. Um, I don't know if the later visuals help either, but it, it, it's since within the context of the existing buildings, but clearly there is there is a loss of openness. Thank you. Do you have a follow up for that, Peter? Or anything you want to? No, thank you. Chair. No, thank you very much, um, Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you, Chair. Michael, a question for you again, if you could leave the presentation open. Um, it's actually around flood risk and drainage. I'm, I believe in your introduction you said the site, albeit none of the built form, was in flood zones one and two, or sorry, flood risk zones one and two. Um, but I note from paragraph 165 on page 61 that, that actually some of the site falls within flood risk three, which is high risk. I just wondered if you could clarify that for, for me at least. Yeah, so the built form, um, let me jump back. So you can see part of the site here in the, the southern areas within flood zone two, which is the lighter blue, and then flood zone three is the, the darkest blue. So the built form of development is is here, the main building, um, and most of the hard standing that wraps around falls outside. So I think it's only sort of landscaping improvement works that would fall within flood zone two and three. Um, you'll see there's a number of conditions relating to, to drainage that are recommended um, within the, the report. So 
uh, officers sort of satisfied and it's, it, it's been subject to consultation with the environment agency lead local flood authority um, and there's no technical objections so the bill form is is solely flood zone one um, but there are areas of landscaping that are in flood zones two and three which which is not an issue and there are conditions to ensure satisfactory methods of, of drainage and contamination and alike um, Councillor Dr Richard Williams Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, I did actually visit this site last week, not not as a member of planning committee, but I did happen to be there. Um, so I did take the opportunity to look at the site, and I was visiting one of the buildings um, right by the side. It's the one to the left um, on on the view that we've currently got. Um, ordinarily, um, yeah, so the one in the, the sort of nearest to us. I mean, ordinarily, I would put a lot of weight, obviously, on maintaining the openness of the green belt. But I must say, personally, having visited the site. That building that is the one nearest to us did feel rather isolated, actually. I was quite struck when I visited it, that it, it felt very isolated from the rest of the campus. And that you can't quite see it, but there's a very significant drop down um, towards the river. Um, so you come in on the road and you really go down. Um, so I don't have particular concerns that this would um, be out of keeping in the setting. And whilst obviously we must put significant weight on openness i am for myself having visited the site satisfied that it would not look out of place the harm would not be huge and that it is um, outweighed by the special circumstances as the officer's uh, report has set out so i'm strongly minded to support this thank you councillor eileen wilson thank you um as i was reading through the papers i i a question came up in my mind when the other buildings were um, given permission, was this already a green belt site? And if otherwise, how I, I couldn't understand how we have a green belt site in the middle of other buildings that are already built. And I was just worried that if planning permission is given for this, if there'd be further encroachment on the green site, because Obviously, there are very good reasons for supporting the research and development um, and the economy it brings to the area. So I, I just would like some clarification around that, please. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, I can respond to that, Chair, through you. Um, I think the site has always been a Greenbelt site because it's proximity to, to Cambridge and obviously the extent of the Greenbelt. So it's a bit of an anomaly that Typically, this sort of site would be perhaps an established employment area akin to Grant Park, but because it's a Greenbelt site, it can't be an established employment area. So each phase of development that has come forward um, has been in the Greenbelt, and it's been necessary to consider very special circumstances at each point. Uh, although members can't give weight to it uh, for the purposes of this application, within the Council's emerging local plan, there is an aspiration that this site will become a, a special policy area. So perhaps in um, when, when the new plan is adopted and uh, another phase of development may come forward, um, you wouldn't have the same green belt issues that are before members today. So I think that is recognised moving forward. But as it stands today, it is a green belt site. It has been a green belt site for many years. Um, these, as I say, these two buildings here were subject to a 2014 outline consent, where again officers felt the the economic benefits, the need, um, etc., outweighed the harm. To the green belt, so it is. It is a growing campus, and I think that will be acknowledged moving into our next local plan. But as it stands today, it is a green belt site, as with previous phases of development. So members do need to weigh up the very special circumstances. Is that, do you want me to take this off screen, by the way? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Councillor Dr. Martin Cohen. Uh, I. Um, take the point about the development, and many of the points that Councillor Richard Williams has made, uh, the development of building on BC 950 on the plan, uh, the nearest to us in the photo, which was given in 19, 2014, which effectively extended the, uh, the path towards the uh, Cambridge direction. Uh, and this is, uh, the, the site that you've got is sandwiched in between two existing, uh, three existing buildings, uh, basically part, uh, within an area which is outli uh, outlined as a park. So, in effect, in, the, in practical terms, whatever the legal terms, in practical terms, the decision was made in 2014 about the extension of the site of the park and, and uh, the, uh, impact, <coughs> the impact of this development I don't see would be any significant. Um, therefore, it, 
uh, I cannot see any, the, the, the effect on the openness therefore will be very limited because the effect on the openness was created by the 2014 uh, permission. Therefore, I can't really see any gr uh, good grounds for re re refusing this. Um, any further extension uh, in any direction is likely that is likely to have a much greater impact on. Uh, uh, on but we won't. Openness. We're not looking. But at we're not looking at that. Yeah. We're looking at existing one. Yeah. So I, I don't. Um, I, I really don't see. I think the decision basically was effectively made, even if it's. Um, we have to re regard each development on its own. Uh, oh, we do. We're looking at it afresh because that's the rules. <laughs> As that's the law. Yeah. But, but uh, I, I think effectively the, the, the position is already is already clear, and I, I support. Thank you very much, Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, I, I think I would um, accept that there is a special circumstance here and um, sort of acknowledge the, the sort of world leading um, work that goes on both in um, the Babraham site and also um, Granton Park. Um, but I just want, I, I don't know whether um, Michael Sexton could clarify, I couldn't really um, determine from the report pack whether the um, solar generation was just associated with the bin store and uh, cycle store, whether it was going to be on the main roof of the um, structure. And I suppose also just to say, well, both in terms of Babraham and Grant Park, live very close to those, it, it does seem um, rather incongruous that you have a very forward-looking um, business there and also quite a young demographic, probably um, they might ask themselves, well, there seems to be a very low um, usage of PVs on, on roofs in both those um, sites generally. Um, it would be nice to see this um, making a correction to that, if, if that's possible. Michael. Yeah, I think there's an intention to use PVs throughout the site, um, and there's a condition to secure the, the BRIAM credentials, so depending on the credits that, that need to be Score to agree, uh, agree, uh, achieve BRIAM excellent, then solar panels may be applicable to the cycle store and the building. Um, certainly, the developer is very keen on making this you know, the, as sustainable a building as possible, so there may well be solar panels on both items. Um, uh, was there a second question in there? No, no, I think that was that was there. Um, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't want to repeat what's, what's been said, but um, for me, the picture that um, uh, Michael put up earlier on, um, you know, showing what the uh, strikes were. Actually, I had two, three strikes, not two. He had two. <laughs> um, so, you know, two, three strikes down and five up. For me, uh, the special circumstances definitely outweigh um, the harm. And I know we can't give weight to that now, um, but just to assure Eileen and uh, you know, those who are listening that we have recognized the importance of this site in the Emerging Local Planner. We have a policy S to VRC, as Michael uh, mentioned earlier on, which actually we hope will enable us to move forward with this site, taking it out of the green belt. As a proposed policy. As a proposed policy. Yes. And um, could I just say that in this and in the other reports we're having, to thank you, Michael, and other officers, that you're showing us the thinking behind your conclusions in terms of weighting and telling us what level of weighting you're putting on each of the aspects. And that's something that um, I'd just like to, to thank you and officers for. It helps us in our deliberations. Um, I'm next, and I just wanted to come back on the um, Briam point that you mentioned, Michael. Um, so what I note is that on paragraph 218 on page 67, the applicant is targeting Briam excellence. But the conditions, and I read the sustainability officers, is that the minimum that the condition is for a minimum of very good. And I would just like to know whether or not we can just say the condition says excellent, seeing as this is cutting edge site that is sort of one of the showcasing of, of things. So there's just a slight difference there. And I, um, you know, and we've, we've had this on other applications around schools as well, whether or not we can go from very good to excellent. But on the site like this, I would hope that we could have excellent, unless you've got reasons why not. Thanks, yeah, I'm just refreshing my, we, we did talk about this quite a lot with the, the sustainability officer. Um, so you've got on page 61, it says the proposed building would deliver a high level of energy efficiency and is targeting a BRIAM excellent rating. So they themselves show um, appetite for this. 
is this the kind of development that we can actually say, well, actually condition it to go that extra mile? I suppose if members were minded to specifically restrict the condition to achieving pre-MX and that you're entitled to do so, I think the the very good is there just to allow a degree of, of flexibility. But I think we're we're sort of confident that excellent will be achieved, but clearly it's within members' gift today if they want to tweak that wording. Um, you can do so. That it is the intention to achieve pre am excellent. Good. So um, we do um, have uh, Councillor Heather Williams <coughs> done speak, but I would like to make a motion that that be um, uh, put it to members as a motion that we do amend that wording in the condition G on page 76. Um, but I haven't gone to the motion yet. <laughs> Councillor Heather, can I do the motion now? So if I put that to members. Um, Seconded. Thank you very much, Councillor Dr. Jimmy Hawkins, which is at condition G, page 76, rather than very good, that becomes excellent in terms of the BRIAM condition. Um, seconded by Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, by affirmation. Good. Thank you very much. And Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just it's sort of timely, actually, as a member of the Greater Cambridge Partnership Assembly, we had an update um, this morning. A nice early start to the day, <laughs> half past eight. You've already been working very Yeah, already on my second meeting. Um, from the Centre for Business Research update, and, and it was on the Greater Cambridge employment. And it's showing the trends and what have you in, in a post-COVID COVID world, um, and how actually our economy has been protected um, a lot because of the type of industry that we have and the research and development. And given given the um, given that area, I think actually that evidence base gives more weight to the um, special circumstances that the research and development holds here. So that was that was timely by coincidence, but timely in my decision making today. I'd also just draw members' attention to paragraph 17, page 49. Um, which refers to the purpose of the green belt, because I think, like many members, our natural instinct of green belt is protect, and that, that's actually quite an emotional instinct as well, because we don't want to see green belt loss. Um, but it says to check the unrestricted sprawl of large built-up areas. I, I do agree that it, it is an infill. If it was to be attempting to breach that hedge, that natural hedge border, or there wasn't the other buildings either side. I, I would say that that purpose hasn't been met, but I think because it is infill, it is. Prevent neighbouring towns merging into one another. That isn't an issue. Um, safeguarding the countryside from encroachment. Again, it's infill in, in my mind. Preserve the setting and special character of the historic town. It doesn't have an impact there. And to assist in urban regeneration by encouraging the recycling of derelict and other urban land. So that's the only thing which the purpose, but it's, um, I think, the majority of the purposes of that green protection have been satisfied as well. So with that in mind, then I'm, I'm minded to support the application um, in its current form, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, and, and, and on that point, as Councillor Heather Williams says, and I think as Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins has said, a huge amount of thought has gone into enabling this in the future so it becomes a policy area being proposed in the local plan because of the local importance to local jobs um, and the local economy, but also because of its um, global and international significance in terms of what's being produced there um, too. So, members, let's go to the vote. Um, and that is on page... 72, the officer recommendation. Um, this would be officer's recommendation, including the amendment to condition G, that this now be BRIAM excellent. Um, if you could, do we do that by affirmation? Because I've not heard anybody say anything that would be political. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to remind members that um, if you are voting to approve this, this will need to be referred to the Secretary of State for a final determination. Thank you. Thank you. Because of that departure. Shall we take that by affirmation? Because I haven't heard anybody say that they would be voting against. Three. Thank you, everybody. It's... What time did you say? It's 11.20. Should we do the break now? 15-minute break? Thanks, everybody.
short break. This is the South Cam's District Council Planning Committee. Um, I would just like to... Hello. I'd just like to let everybody know that um, agenda item 10, to confirm that that has been withdrawn, so we will not be dealing with that today. So if anybody is on the live stream, um, just so that you know that agenda item 10, that application... The application. Yeah, yes, the application has been withdrawn. And therefore, we will not be dealing with that item on today's agenda. Thank you. So we're now at agenda item 7, which is on page 81 of the printed um, agenda report. Prac. This is application 21 stroke 03628 stroke full application of 36 Apthorpe Street in Fullbourne. The proposal is for the erection of a three bedroom, one and a half story timber framed barn style build dwelling on land to the rear of St. Martin's Cottage. And the applicants are Mr. and Mrs. Keith Carter. That was, sorry, it sounded like my dog scratching at the carpet. So, but um, that's some building up above, I think it says. And the key material considerations, principle of development, character design and heritage, residential amenity, trees, ecology, drainage, contamination, highways, and other matters. Um, is it a departure of application? Yes. And the application has been brought to the committee because the proposal has been called in by um, local member, ward member, councillor Cohn, and referred to the planning committee by the committee's delegation panel. Presenting officer is Jane Rodens. Are you with us, Jane? Hello there. Hello there. Hello. Thank you. If you can give us your any updates in your summary, thank you very much, Jane. Thank you. There's no updates to give at this point in time. Um, I shall start my presentation. Would it be possible to confirm that you can see that slide? Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Chair. So this application is, as you said, for full planning permission for uh, one dwelling to the rear of St. Martin's Cottage in 36 Epsilon Street in Fullborn. Uh, the left-hand site location plan shows the site and the right-hand block plan shows the proposal um, within the red area. So this application is marked as the red star on the left-hand plan. It's outside of the development framework, which is marked with the black dotted line. It's inside the conservation area, which is the pink line. It's outside the green belt. You can't quite see it on this plan, but it's all this area to the north and east of the site. Uh, to the front of the site, you've got St. Martin's Cottage um, and number 38 and 40, which are both grade two listed buildings. Here's a further detailed plan of the proposed dwelling um, in its proposed location. So it's to go along the site with two parking areas and access along an existing track from Amphort Street. Here are the proposed elevations. It's to be one and a half storeys in height with a basement. Um, the plans in front of you show the living accommodation that's being proposed. So here are some photos of the site. This is looking towards the current shed that's at the back of the site. So I've stood roughly where the house would be. Stood further back into the site, looking towards the shed. This is turned round, looking back towards St. Martin's Cottage. So where that tree is in the middle is roughly to be the new boundary between the two dwellings. This is the access track, and you can see that shed in the background. This is one that's to be used. This is further back towards the main road, looking up the access track with both the listed cottages either side. This application has been recommended refusal as the application site is located outside the development framework of Fullbourne. Also, there's been less than substantial harm identified with no public benefit given for this new house. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. And we don't have anybody speaking as an objector, but as the applicant, we do have Keith Carter. Um, are you with us, Mr. Carter? Hello. Sorry about that. And you understand the procedure for the three minutes? Cool. So thank you very much. So take your time. Can we have slide one? 
Jane, we won't start your time yet until we have slide one up on the screen. Can you see that slide? Yes, we can. Thank you. OK, well, good morning and thank you very much for this opportunity to explain respectfully why both grounds as stated for refusal no longer apply and should be overruled. Firstly, all matters of design, character and heritage have been fully satisfied as the report confirms. It has only been refused because of public benefits that outweigh the minor, less than substantial harm it dictates have not been made clear. Slide two, please. There are multiple benefits, not least public safety alone. The existing access lane is used regularly by us and various neighbours and currently suffers a dangerous lack of visibility as vehicles emerge to cross the pavement. <coughs> Excuse me. Visibility displays as part of this application will fully eliminate this existing and very real danger to pedestrians. There are substantial biodiversity gains. We're planting a fruit orchard, a large wildflower area, replacing hedgerows with native species and solid fencing for nature-friendly fencing, plus numerous wildlife assets. Forborn Village will gain an extra high-quality family home and the street scene will benefit by a green and more attractive facade to the existing access lane. St Martin's Cottage, as a result, will become more viable and substantially more affordable as a village home without the excessive gardens. Also, as a local listed asset, it will benefit from new ownership to adopt the mantle of care that sadly, with genuine health issues, we are both no longer able to continue as we have for two decades happily. Finally, we too remember are members of the public and this will enable us to retire within the community still and to keep some of our garden at least. This proposal does conform with paragraph 202 and it maximises viable use as required and in principle is redundant. Slide three, please. The second reason, as policy S7, is wholly contingent upon an incorrect boundary line as drawn on the map, which follows an inexplicable and inconsistent route across the middle of our garden, instead of a more sensible route emulating the conservation line just 30 metres adjacent, which does correctly delineate the greenbelt portion of our very large garden and is rightly sacrosanct and will remain so, totally unchanged, as garden. Slide four, please. Slide four. Slide four, please. <clears throat> All of our garden, including the proposed plot, is fully encompassed both physically and visibly, visibly within a robust boundary of mature hedgerows and fencing that clearly distinguishes it as garden, not countryside. This line can only have been drawn by someone who physically hasn't seen the land. Maps can be wrong, people do make errors, and to refuse this application based on a factually incorrect map would be wrong and unjust in the extreme not least if there is local precedent approving similar, even identical plots. Slide five, please. This application proposes just one highly sustainable dwelling, respectful of its heritage obligations, with green technologies inherent to an eco-friendly self-build initiative. It makes more viable use of an over-large garden with existing access and is all but invisible from the road. It does offer public benefits and has overwhelming support from neighbours and Fulborn Parish Council. Slide six, please. The single, the single fundamental fact upon which S7 is based is flawed, and so this decision to refuse is unsound. In conclusion, national policy states that planning authorities can make decisions to approve an application that departs from a development plan if material considerations indicate that the plan should not be followed. And I respectfully request that the committee recognise these new facts and approve this application. Thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for staying within the time. Um, <coughs> members, any questions? <coughs> Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, for a bit more clarification about why the um, St Martin's Cottage isn't viable. And also, um, I'd like, uh, I'll ask this question later whether that's a valid planning consideration. Thank you. Shall I answer that? Yes, please. Um, it's not viable. We, we actually tried because we've, we both, we can't keep it up any longer. We can't look after it any longer as it is. It takes all of our time and our health reasons why we are going to be in public. Stop is using it. We have put it on the market twice over the last year or two, um, both with different agents, and both times it attracted lots of attention, but everybody, without doubt, just said, quote, unquote, I don't need that much land. I don't want that much land. I want a normal garden. So we're trying to put it back to the garden as it was 100 years ago from the plans, using that next garden as a plot for us, which allows us to stay there. It is literally unviable with that garden. People don't want it. They seem to want just smaller gardens today. It's a shame. We've had 20 years of the good life with animals and everything, but they don't want it now. 
and it does make it, it's knocked half a million off the price. It literally knocks it down by 500,000, which is substantially more affordable as a village home then. That's how I, and I think it's much more viable. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine, thank you. Councillor Dr. Martin Khan. You talk about building, you talk about building um, a timber frame dwelling. Um, what sort of timber frame are you going to be using? Is this going to be green oak? Is it going to be modern timber? Um, um, are, you using, uh, are you using innovative techniques or is it standard techniques? Yes, thank you. Um, well, we, we're really kind of welcoming lots of these green initiatives. Obviously, at this stage of planning, we're trying to get approval, and I'm quite happy to have it con con um, conditions upon certain things. Um, but the architect, we, we've seen many ways. I mean, oak frame, it's an oak frame timber clad building, which is arguably apparently 100% sustainable if responsibly forest, which it will be, because I will manage the build. I won't do it, but I'll manage it to make sure it's all done properly with no waste. So the oak frame and the timber cladding is sustainable. Um, thermal efficiency wherever we can. Certainly I will do high performance insulation because my plan is, and my, my own principle is, that if you don't need the heat, then you don't have to spend energy. Uh, don't forget I'm living here. This isn't a commercial project. This isn't for, for profit. This is for me to live in. So I'll, it's saving cost as well as the planet. There'll be passive solar um, benefits such as, I mean, the fact that the glass facing the east side, its orientation is east. So in, in the daytime we get the sun from where you're looking at. It comes up and does that. And in the evening it goes down and does that. So both sides will allow the sun in. And I'm hoping to put the glass in. It's not solar glazing. I think that actually makes electric. But the glazing that keeps the heat in. Uh, low E glazing it's called. Um, certainly ground source heat pump. It's a no-brainer. That apparently is the best thermal option. And we have all of that top lump of garden to put the ground heat source in. After that, we have a stove in the kitchen and a stove in the lounge. So we shouldn't even need any other heating for the house. They will be... Um, the, the log stones, but the biomass log stones, stoves, sorry, not stones. So they are, quote, eco-design is the current um, 2022 it will come in, where log fires can only use certain, certain log energies. And that, everything else I can do, I mean, even low-energy low, low light bulbs, electric, electric vehicle charging points, rainwater harvesting. We can use the rainwater harvesting, for, if nothing else, for planting. So thank you. I think thank you very much for the answer on that question. Um, Councillor Peter Payne. Chair, my question was broadly the same as, uh, as Dr. Khan, so I'm happy to the information given. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's all the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and we did have somebody coming from the parish council, but they've been unable to come in um, today. So, but we do have the local member, Councillor Graham Cohn. Um, and so we'll just wait for Graham, Councillor Cohn, to be able to take the microphone. Thank you, and I'm sure you're very well aware of the, the system. I think you need to put the microphone on. Thanks very much, Chair, for allowing me to um, speak on this application and also um, for allowing me to bring it to the committee as well. Um, it's not something I've made a habit of over the last uh, six years. So You have some um, credit. Um, <laughs> So it is a first time for, for me bringing, you know, calling anything into, into the committee. So um, I've written a little statement about um, why I, I think that you should consider this, this application. So um, national planning policy establishes a presumption in favour of sustainable development, stating that available sites should be used more effectively we must promote an effective use of land, especially underutilised land, and to seek out opportunities within conservation areas. Fullborn needs individual homes, not just large developments and exception sites. St Martin's Cottage has been in the village for over 360 years and deserves to be fully included within the village boundary. Either it's part of Fullbourne or it isn't. It can't be sort of half in and half out. Um, the village boundary line, as drawn, is inconsistent and incorrect. This is a domestic garden, not countryside. This application, in my view, will, be ap will have absolutely no impact on the green belt. The decision to refuse on the grounds of policy S7 should be overruled in my view. 
there is also local precedent within the village for similar single development with similar boundary lineage. It's a high quality, highly sustainable, low carbon home taken into account the village design statement principles and the village's emerging neighbourhood plan. I consider this application um, a much needed and valuable addition to our village housing stock that will also release an existing home uh, for new ownership. On a personal level, I am pleased that the application is coming forward from a member of our community who cares about Fullbourne and wants to remain living in the village. Splitting down the curtilage makes total sense, creating two better sized gardens and in doing so, St Martin's Cottage itself will become substantially more affordable as a village home. In conclusion, apart from the boundary issue that I hope the, the committee will use their judgment on, this application is an acceptable one and will benefit Fullbourne as a village. Unusually, this application is supported by myself as district councillor and has full support of the, the parish council and hasn't got objections from resident groups like Fullbourne Forum or, or individual residents. So you know, it's an, an unusual case where you get sort of virtually everyone in the, in the village in agreement on, on an application. Um, it's, it's, it's quite rare. So um, I urge the committee to approve this application um, because I think it's the, the sensible thing to do. I know there was supposed to be a member of the parish council uh, coming who's um, been held up um, and he's messaged me just to, just to simply say um, I think most of the points that he raises have actually been covered by um, the applicant and myself but it, you know, the parish council fully supports this application and have been clear about that um, in, in their statement to the application. Um, and you know, are happy that you know, it won't be of any detriment to, to, to the village at all. So I just want to add that at the end. So thanks very much for letting me, me speak. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for local member councillor Henry Batchelor? Thank you, Chair. Hi, Graeme. Um, Graeme, just a quick question going back to the boundary issue, just so I'm clear on this. Yeah. Are you saying that the boundary has been drawn wrong on the map or you feel the boundary as it currently is, is in the wrong place and should be brought uh, um, inwards? Both, actually. So I think both historically it's, it's been drawn incorrectly because it's quite clear when you visit the site that um, it, you know, it's garden, not open countryside. Um, and, you know, from uh, a t today point of view, I think that, you know, it, it, it's very reasonable to, to have development in that location given given the boundary, I think it should be uh, different to, to what it is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and perhaps what we can do is ask the, the case officer just explain, they've included information from the inspector about individual settlements outside of the boundary, which obviously they have to take into consideration. So we can ask for a bit more explanation of that. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think at page 88 at paragraph 37, that actually explains just how long this boundary has actually been in place. So if the parish and residents felt that it was incorrect, they've had an opportunity of 15 or 16 years in which to um, get that problem, uh, as they saw it, sorted out. Um, and I, I take on board very much uh, what the, um, the two speakers have just said about the design, and that's, I'm sure we all think it's a, a nice design, etc. However, um, there is one thing that wouldn't be able to be done. We cannot, I don't think, and I'll get legal advice maybe from Mr. Reid or the, the officers, we cannot make this a personal uh, approval. Um, and though the gentleman may um, be wishing himself to be uh, in uh, any new property there, there is absolutely no guarantee. I have seen over my 30 years of being here, Lord help us all, um, that uh, I, I've seen applications where um, it's supposed to be for one thing and it's, it's not ended up in that way. But the really important thing here is, which we need to focus upon, I think, 
is the fact that it is so against policy. And there's not a village in South Cambridgeshire that doesn't have properties that would fit in exactly with this, that uh, the house uh, is, and a gar part of the garden is within uh, the village boundary um, or, or development uh, approval um, acceptance. And so, Councillor Roberts, is, is there a question for Councillor or in the No, this, I'm sorry, Chairman, mine was going to be my spiel. Yeah, that's okay. So, we'll just find out if there's any other questions. Thank you, Vice Chair. If, if there's any other questions, if not, it's purely functional. We're now in the. Oh, Harvey. Oh, Councillor Jeff Harvey, one question, then we'll come back to Councillor Roberts. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I was just. Um, I wonder if we could understand a bit more about the visibility displays and the um, sort of alleged danger, because I, I would have thought currently... Is this for Councillor Cohn? Because I don't um, think he mentioned that, Councillor Well, Jeff. yes, okay, okay, sorry, I would have... Um, would Councillor Cohn be prepared to comment on that? Or, um, no, okay. I think we've moved past it, so we'll, we'll, okay, we'll take we'll, it into we'll, the debate. Um, well, let's, let's take that to the next Thank stage. you very much. Okay, thank you. We're in the debate, Councillor Deborah <laughs> Sorry, Chairman, if I muddled you up. I jumped, I jumped in there thinking that we'd... We often done. wait for the questions. I was giving you a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. So the, the, my priority here is, is the policy. And as I think I was just saying, there's not a village in South Cambridge that doesn't have just these same situations where um, something um, is, is just out of the village boundary, right on the edge, or part of it is in the village boundary and part of it isn't. And you set dreadful, dangerous precedents um, if you go um, along with this line. I've had attempts to uh, incursion in all my villages. Um, and, uh, you know, if we have a p policy, it's there for a reason. And it's been thought out. And it's been thought out over a long period of time. And if we don't support that policy, then we've got great danger of our villages actually moving out uh, into uh, other areas. And once you allow one um, brand new, because it's not a replacement dwelling and it's not a barn conversion, it's a brand new uh, property in the open countryside. Once you allow it for one, how do you stop it? coming forward from other people in the next part of the field saying, well, I would like this little bit of my land. It's just outside the village envelope, but next door you allowed something. And, and I think we really cannot, we know the pressures on this district. And that's why we have spent, again, recently so much time looking at the coming local plan to make sure that development is, as far as we can actually, um, believe is going to be in the right places and that we do not have this chip chip chipping at our little villages okay. um, so I, i'm sorry that there is no way whatsoever i can support so, this. what i'm saying is on page 95 the first recommended refusal reason is for the policy s7 which is about outside the development framework yep. so i think that's what you're you're saying the council deborah roberts yes. yep that, thank you very much and councillor jeff harvey well, I um, actually move on to a different question connected with uh, Councillor Roberts' um, question. Um, is it, um, I mean, clearly this has been looked at in the last local plan, and, and, and in some sense the fact that this boundary wasn't redrawn then sort of affirms that it is in the correct place. But are, are the boundaries really examined down to that level of detail, I would have thought? In other words... I, mean, I think, so, Councillor Harvey, what you're asking is what's the process for de yes, defining exactly right. the village development frameworks and whether or not those are all reviewed in new local plan. Um, who, Nigel, do you want to answer that? Or Dr. Yeah. Um, when you were planning to build new if, if we all look at our maps that we, that we all have at home of the villages, it quite clearly shows on the, mm -hmm. uh, the lines... Yep. Which properties? Yep. It actually shows no, every think, single property. So Rose, I think what the question is, what is what's the process? I think we're just saying, what's the process in terms of um, planning it? Oh, Chair, I'll help as much as I can, although I'm not a policy officer. Um, I mean, the village framework boundaries are reviewed, but my understanding is that they are not reviewed in such fine detail so that every part of every village framework is, is looked at. 
um, they're, they're reviewed because people come forward with proposals to um, include a land typically that has subsequently been developed within the village framework. My understanding is they are not mm -hmm. um, reviewed in that level of detail. Thank you. And so as I'm under, um, so understanding as well, so it, if it would be in a neighbourhood plan allocation, that would be one opportunity for it, or the parish council brings forward, as Councillor Deborah Roberts was saying, you know, a, a proposal that the village development framework be, a, you know, a, amended. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, I think I'm trying to think on, on consistency grounds as well from, from myself and, and us as a committee that um, I, I agree that it should come here. I agree that it does, you know, it is a departure and it breached those policies and, and um, respect the comments that have been made already on that. And I, I do understand um, those emotions and attachments and the policies we've put in place. But the purpose of committee, I would also say, is to is to look at these applications where it doesn't meet policy. Officers, you know, have done the right thing in their recommendation because that's compliant with the rules. But it is down to us as a committee whether we whether we wish to use discretion on those rules from time to time. So it's in the right place, and the officers have made the right decision. However, I, I do find it more difficult um, than than other members. I think the, the visuals that have been shown show that it's not what we would traditionally call open countryside. I appreciate there's this boundary dispute and I'm not a boundaries expert and I'm not going to pretend to be. Um, I do think the boundary does look odd in the way that it comes in and goes out. So I, I, can, I can listen to both sides and, um, and take merit from both those sides. Um, with... With that in mind, I'm also thinking that normally when we see these applications, um, I, I'm normally on the uh, same side, actually, as, as Councillor Roberts and, and defending, defending those policies and, and what have you, because they normally come with objection. It is rare that we have parish council, not only have we got no sort of object, objections, we actually have letters of support um, which is something that is quite rare. And I've always put an emphasis on listening to communities, that we're planning with them and that we need to do what they want. And I, I am inclined to think that we should also not just put emphasis on that when opposing, but supporting, because I think we've all sat in parish council meetings where parish councils get infuriated. We wanted to refuse it, you approved it. We wanted to support it, and you... Um, then refuse it. You know, it's it's one of those. So I am struggling with it. I think there are merits. And given its local support, I, I perhaps am minded to support the parish council and support the local residents and their, and their desire for this dwelling on the basis that there are also properties. If I'm, I might help if we have the plan re, re display chair that we've got properties in that line already if it was going beyond that line then i would jane would agree. you be able to put up the, the, on so the screen yeah i'd like clarification because i think there are properties i am familiar with that area as well and i know there has been quite a bit of development in that area um but i think whatever we decide if, if we decide to approve it we have to acknowledge that it is a departure and the that we are I think what we, we would need is what would be your reasons, so planning reasons, if you were going against the officer's recommendation? But you don't, not going to ask you to give them now, but if you can think to help us. Yeah. Nigel? No, thank you, Chair. I, I think for members, there, there are two things here. Firstly, um, it is quite clearly contrary to policy, and it, this, this could happen again and again and again. So um, you would need to set out what your material planning considerations are in this case, that justify a departure from that policy. And the other factor is the other reason of refusal that we've put forward, and I recognise this hasn't been in the debate yet, but just to put into members' minds, is that we've identified heritage harm here, and there's a requirement to balance that harm against public benefit. And as officers, we haven't identified that there is any public benefit. So that's just to put into your minds for the debate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, so I will move on, but think about what your reasons, that's what we've just got to challenge ourselves with. As you're saying, there's that balance there that we've got to No challenge. pressure on me then, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Dr. Marty Clark. 
Uh, I agree with a lot of what uh, Councillor Heather Williams has been saying. Uh, I, again, was, this was another site which I looked at and felt I couldn't really consider it without going and a look at the site. And of course, it's difficult to get access to the rear, but, but you can see it from the road. Um, and the photographs of the actual on the site, which were given here, uh, confirm what I was thinking. Um, you have a very exceptional sort of, uh, situation here. You've got a very small plot outside the village envelope, but not within the green belt. Strength, strength, um, so it's uh, uh, which, when you look on site, is clearly part of the garden, isn't it? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, pra practically looking at it, you see it's not open countryside. Um, it can't, it's not really open countryside. It's, it's part of the, the town. So uh, I feel that the, the argument that it's in, uh, in the country uh, doesn't stand, uh, to my mind. Uh, that's the way I look at it. Um, the argument about whether it has a detrimental impact upon the listed buildings. The listed buildings are really beautiful. They're more beautiful than I, I realized when I got out and saw them. Uh, but the proposed building is also very interesting. It's modern use of traditional uh, techniques. Uh, if it used green oak, which is an unusual technique, uh, basically like the 14th century, which is being used in modern buildings, it would be a, an example to show other people could use in conservation areas. And, and, I, and I would see a benefit in that. It's also can, I, can I just ask you, because, so it's... It's a timber frame. It's, it's oak frame. Can I just say, it's recognized in the report that it is minor, less than it's substantial yes, harm. Oak. But you mentioned benefit. And what we've just heard from, from Nigel and also the report in terms of reasons refusal, no, it has not seen the benefit. What benefit are you talking Public benefit. No, so uh, my, my argument is not a, that it's an, it's an interesting building which will provide a, a, a suitable complement uh, and might be useful for other, uh, how you might build in, in close uh, proximity. I don't see that visually it has a benefit and I don't, uh, a detriment, sorry, to the, to the existing buildings. I, 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 uh, just because it's a new building doesn't, to me, make it automatically a, a harm. The, if, if the building creates a more interesting uh, built environment, then I think this one would do. So, so I, 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 I would not actually agree with that. I would agree that it is in neutral or, or perhaps because it creates a more interesting group of buildings, it, it, you might consider it a benefit. Um, the, the other question is it's clearly against policy. I absolutely agree it should come, uh, come to committee. Good. Uh, and so can I just go at all of those members? I'm going to sort of interrupt because we have to sort of, mm. if we're really making this decision, we have to be kind of rigorous. So on page 89, mm. paragraph 48, I think the officer agrees, the conservation officer, that with the applicant in terms of what you're saying as well, um, mm. Councillor Khan, but it says that the impact, paragraph 48, is on the, the setting, mm, yeah. rather than, which is the garden setting. So rather than the building itself, it's agreeing with you, that's minor, <laughs> but the, the, what they're arguing is on the setting side of it. So we've just got to keep in mind, I think, a little bit, that if we're going to overturn the officer, mm. we need to be able to the, the, address the, their issue. The next question is, is whether it's a pre what sort of precedent it is. Um, most situations where you have a, a, a gap of, a bit of white land between the uh, built uh, the, the village envelope and the green belt, it's quite a large, significant area, and there could be alternative additional areas nearby which could be developed. In this case, you've got one tiny plot that uh, there's clearly not going to be development, uh, unlikely to be development on the green belt because that's that, that that's clearly designated. So, as a precedent in this rather exceptional situation, I, 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 I see it's unlikely to lead to other, other, uh, other cases. If, if we can show what the reasons for the overturning, overturning the officer the are, yes. which yeah. you say are exceptional reasons. reasons yeah. So, so uh, it has the support of the whole village, which I think is a um, uh, general support of the village, which I think is also an exceptional reason. It's unusual in a situation like that. Um, so, what I basically it comes down to when I went out to look at the site, I thought, why, why would it? What, what harm is this actually doing? Uh, and I, 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 I just couldn't feel that there was a, 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 a solid reason. Okay, thank you. I think so I, my, my, ten, my, my, verse, uh, my, my tendency is to go to override rec recommendations, which are justified, but. Uh, in these exceptional circumstances to feel that it's justified to override them. I'm going to come back to you while you think and write down where you think the, the reasons for overturning us, just more succinctly, so that we've got them in policy terms on material planning consideration. Um, Councillor Peter Fane. 
Thank you, Chair. Like Councillor Khan, I'm very sympathetic to the uh, position put forward by Councillor Heather Williams earlier on, and indeed the local member. Um, I think it, it would appear on the face of it, and I don't know the circumstances, that the, uh, the village framework may have been drawn incorrectly. There were lots of reasons why it might vary from the green belt, fewer reasons why it might vary from the boundary of the conservation area. Um, however, that is the village framework as it stands, mm -hmm. and it may be that there are other opportunities for correcting that if this is an error and considering this on another occasion. Um, I follow what Dr. Khan said about the exceptional design, although, of course, this is an outline application. Um, I think if it were in the open country, it might even be appropriate to consider this under ATE as... I think uh, it's a full application, not outline. If we're in the open country, it might be um, relevant to consider this under Section 80E of the NPPF as truly outstanding, the highest standards of architecture, helping to raise standards of design more generally, uh, as Dr. Khan said, and enhancing its immediate setting. But I don't think that has been put forward in this case. So sympathetic as I am, I have to say that with the boundary drawn as it is, there is not sufficient um, benefit from this to justify a variation from, from our current policy, whether or not that current policy is correctly drawn in this case. Thank you. And just to clarify, this is a full application. So you know, if, we, if you were, and the, as you're saying, it hasn't been put forward with justification of that this is about outstanding buildings in the outside the development framework of the Green Belt. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, bearing in mind, we've just um, had a look at the Babraham um, site and done the, uh, the weighting of the strikes and the pluses. Um, I think we need to be consistent and look at this in the same way. Mm -hmm. Now, strike one, it's outside the framework, whether we agree or not that it is correctly drawn. So strike two, it's in the countryside, even though it's not open countryside. And trying to look for the benefits in this, um, plus one, I would say, is it does provide a local home for a local family. And plus two is that the design is very good, is supported by the parish council, and actually they have made the statement that, uh, let me see if I can, sorry, beg your pardon. Um, they make mention of the design and site of the dwelling respects the principles of the adopted urban village design guide, mm -hmm. which is a statutory SPD. And so I kind of look at this and I'm going, Two strikes, two pluses. <laughs> what would you say? There's another, there is one. I, this is really, really helpful, Councillor Dr. Hawkins, I think, in terms of our balance. The, what is in the officer's report is strike three is in terms of the listed building. So that's something we have to consider. So they put that as their second reason for that it's on the setting and that the needs, you have to prove the public benefit if there is any kind of harm to the. So that would be three. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, that's fine. In which case, uh, if we look at paragraph 206 in the MPPF, uh, it says local planning authorities should look for opportunities for new development within conservation areas and world heritage sites and within the setting of heritage assets to enhance or better rebuild their significance. Yeah. Now, whether or not this does that mm -hmm. <laughs> is something that we perhaps need to um, consider. So you might say you've got Three strikes and three pluses. <laughs> we don't move forward. <laughs> but I just thought I'd put that in the mix. Thank I, you. I think that's excellent and really, really helpful. It lays out exactly why we're here, which is this, this, this issue of balance. Yes, um, Councillor Henry, your bachelor was and then Williams. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to rehash the village boundary issue again, Chair, because as for me, that is the one key issue 
why I believe the application should be refused um, as a member that uh, operates within a ward that has had developments built outside of the village boundary and there's a member who has sat in this room and argued till I was blue in the face that it shouldn't happen. Um, I think it would be controversial of me to then sit here and agree that we should be overturning that policy. So for me, Chair, the one real issue is the fact it is outside the village framework. However, incorrectly, people believe it to be drawn. Um, so for me, I shall be voting to refuse. Thank you. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank, thank you, Chair. I, I just want to clear up my earlier question about the viability of the um, present um, uh, the, the cottage um, and whether the non-viability which um, the applicant has suggested, whether that is a valid planning consideration. I suspect not, but I just wanted that cleared up. Shall we ask? Could we ask the planning officer? Yeah. Kate, can you Fine. answer? I'm in technical difficulties then. Um, so, material planning considerations, one of the ones that wouldn't be considered material planning consideration is, of course, public, um, so the value of land. Um, sorry, I'm just my screen. In the conservation errors comments that were received on this application, um, they went through the heritage statement that had been submitted, and that was where the less than substantial harm had been identified. It's in the applicant supporting statement, and they put forward the reasons why the public benefit would be overcome. And in the heritage, our conservation officer's view that the viability for St Martin's Cottage wouldn't be a public benefit, because it's only benefiting one house, St Martin's cottage. Of course, other material planning considerations that are considered by officers, um, one of them isn't value of properties. The value of a property isn't a material planning consideration. I hope that answers your question. Um, it's it's for me, my, I've asked to speak, and it's me to follow up on that, because I'm trying to look at this, this weighting of balance, because I think there are different situations in, in different villages, and I'm looking at the three strikes, the three, the, you know, the three positives. Absolutely, we need to defend um, strongly any encroachment and, and going against our policy. But I do know that there are, and I don't think that we should do it by individual applications, we change development frameworks. That, that, you know, that isn't the way that we should be going forward. Um, but I am very much listening to harm when it comes to balance this is often about perception of benefit and harm and the fact that we have this anomaly where we have you know very very strong local support for this means that in terms of how that harm or benefit is being perceived i think we ought to give um give weight to and i want to because we haven't got the public benefit um i think clarified kate when you just said that James, sorry, but you just said that the public benefit for the viability to maintain a listed building couldn't be accepted as public because it's one building. But that one building is a public asset being a listed building. And nobody can, so you as an individual owner of that can't do whatever you want to because it's a public, um, there is public value to it. So can I just explore that a bit more, your thinking around saying that you see that as an individual benefit, making that listed building viable, its maintenance, rather than a public one. Yeah, that's no problem. Um, so there might be other cases, and the Nigel can uh, come back on this if need be, that there may be some uh, applications where the public benefit for, say, maintaining a listed building, if it's um, in structural, structural repairs, the public benefit may be that part of the development of a site behind it might help pay for a new roof, for example. That might be the viable actual physical public benefit of making or sustaining a property. Um, of course, this was considered by our conservation officers who have dealt with lots of other listed buildings in the district. And of course, they've seen that the viability of one house, keeping it in ownership, um, isn't one public benefit for one house? Does that does that help answer the question? 
just wanted to say that um, I, I feel that we, we don't have the evidence anyway that, um, that this, um, this property would fall into disrepair. And you'll see in the report in paragraph 54, we say that we feel that's quite unlikely actually. And there certainly isn't any hard evidence to, to, to show that it would fall into disrepair if members were, were not to you know were not to approve this application. So I think that for me is a critical point. Thank you. So just to finalize, thank you for answering those those questions. And, and where I am at the moment with this is I think there is potential for there to be exceptional reasons. That's about outstanding character and sustainability of the, the design of this building. And if we could see evidence of how this would improve the viability of the listed building, some kind of direct evidence of that. Because if somebody struggled really hard and strived hard to maintain it, it doesn't mean that that can always kind of happen. But if there was some direct evidence of how this could contribute in terms of public benefit, that may outweigh the harm that we see for going against policy. But at the moment, I don't think it's been presented in that that way sufficiently for me, but I'm, you know, I'm very, very sensitive to it could, has the potential for an exception. Thank you. Councillor Jess Harvey and then Councillor Deborah Roberts. Oh, I think you were before actually, weren't you? Sure. Thank you, Chair. I think I've answered my own question, so I'll pass over it to you, Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams before Councillor Deborah Roberts. I think she asked first, sorry. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Um, sorry, I fear I was going to get missed out there. <laughs> but um, so a couple of couple of things just from listening to the debate. One thing we haven't touched on that was suggested, and I don't know if officers can give us any advice on that, was about improved safety on the access and, and displays. So I'm just wondering if we've got any information on that because I think we're all, well, not all of us, but some of us are struggling with that with that balance and the strike, I like the strike system that Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins has introduced here. Um, that in itself could, could be a benefit to the other properties, but I don't think we've not really had that shown. So if officers could give us some clarity on that, that would be Clarity, good. I think, in terms of the, of the waiting. I think this thing that Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins has referred to is what, again, I'd like to say thank you to officers, because what they're presenting us with is the waitings of all of these to, to be able to make our balance. But um, on the highways issue, so what... The applicant said, well, this is a public benefit because it would improve safety. Chair, I did have a second. Did we ask you, that? Oh, to the same one to the planning officer? Well, I think, yeah. We, yeah. So the other thing was, it was referenced about um, on biodiversity grounds, mm -hmm. about orchard and some sort of, you know, um, plan to put that, mm. put that in. Which again, you may say that that's a, a public benefit to reaching targets, etc. So I'm just wondering if, if officers know whereabouts that is, and if that's conditionable, um, and to what extent, um, for example, if it was going to be open to the public or for the orchard, and etc. Thanks. So um, I think what was uh, the was seeing, are there any of the in those issues that they could be seen as public benefit or benefit to help out, outweigh the harm, which would be around the safety. And the biodiversity. Yeah, and I wasn't sure if, if the orchard reference was one for private use only or whether it was for community benefit. Thank you. Okay, so if I start with the highways one, can you see that screen? So this is the one of the plans that's been submitted as part of the application. Um, and this is the visibility space that's been put on it. So the highways authority raised objection at the beginning because they had concerns about the visibility space. Further information was submitted, um, and they're, now they're happy with the visibility space that they can be proven on site. There's no development as such being proposed to, to, to alter the access. It's just been proven that the visibility space can be achieved on the site. Right, so it's a, what it's showing is it's overcome the highway's objection to show that the visibility displays are. Yes, yeah. And then with the biodiversity, uh, that can be conditioned. Do you, hang on, can the oh, women might want to come back? Sorry, and I'm, it's difficult. Perhaps I should have asked this when um, the applicant, because it, it sort of suggested there was going to be some works done that was going to improve displays. So 
I, I can hear that the, there is some sort of disagreement here that there is going to be improvements. Are officers aware of any improvements that are planned? So, Jen, I think the difference is, Jen, what you're saying is um, what was then produced has overcome the highways officer objection and is the visibility displays that we would normally expect for anything versus what the applicant said, that there's a public benefit because this is going to dramatically um, improve safety for everybody around there. Yes. So, I'm not aware of any development that's going to go ahead to take down any boards. I'm just checking the plans. Two seconds. Um, I'm not aware of any physical works that are going to take place, just that they've managed to prove that they can meet the highways expected visibility displays. Okay, and the second question was around was around the positioning of the orchard um, and plans that were referred to and whether that's going to have access to public, therefore potentially community benefit, or whether it was just as a private garden area? So in the plans that have been submitted, it shows that it will be part of the private garden for the, the house with it extending further up into the countryside into the green belt. There's no information in their application to show that they'll be made to the public. That, um, can you only assume it will be up to the owner of the site? Can I just can, just clarify, did you say that the garden would extend into the green belt, where at the moment it doesn't extend into the green belt? Bear with me two seconds if I show you the plans. Sorry. Open. So this, can you see that slide? Yep. So this is the what would become the new ownership of St Martin's Cottage at the beginning, and the red line would become the, the curtilage, the ownership of the new house. So this is that shared with the boundary here, with the house at the front here. So this would become in the ownership of this new house here. This would become their, their site. And, and that site, if you show us back when we went back to the development framework, yep. Yeah, so there's that shed there. Here's the house here. So their garden would be extending further up into this area that's part of the green belt. Okay. So that how does an meet? So is, there, is there any indication that any of that would be made public, that garden? No, there's no indication yeah. in that application Thank you. made public. Is that fine, Councillor Thomas? Thank you. Yes, it was just knowing whereabouts it was um, and whether there was any sort of public access, footpaths, things like that. And Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you again for allowing me to quickly come back, Chairman. I will try and keep it quickly. Um, yeah, there was talk, and you, you yourself mentioned it, about the design and about exception. My understanding of the policies are that uh, land outside a village envelope, um, if there is a, an application to develop a new property on such, it has to uh, actually reach a very high bar. Um, it's not just, it's a nice house. Uh, it has to be exceptional. It has to be very special. And Nigel, I hope, will confirm this. It has to be very special. And if you may remember a few months ago, we had one at Falmere uh, where we actually had the design panel had looked at it. Um, the design officers had looked at it and they concurred that it was. I didn't particularly agree with that, but it, that's the argument that was put. So we actually had an argument that we could put. Um, if this uh, application is to be given any approval based on uh, exceptional design, I don't think we've got that. I think we would actually have to defer today and we would have to go to the design panel and to the officers and actually ask them to balance that up and look at it. I think we cannot possibly say that it's such a wonderful design uh, that we can give it approval. We have absolutely no positive um, uh, situation that we can prove that to be the case. So. My, my feelings are you can throw it out on it's outside the village envelope uh, and it has not proven that it's a, an exceptional design. Otherwise, defer it and, and go through a further process. So, thank you very much. And I think what I think it was Councillor Peter Vane who brought in that policy section 80E 
Um, but what he recognised was it hasn't been presented in that way, so therefore the officers haven't weighed it up in that way. It's a possibility if it was spent, but it was outstanding to re-bring it, but not to defer it because it's not actually part of what's being presented today. Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins, and I'd like us to move towards... Yeah. And that's what I'm hoping we can do. <laughs> um, having looked at the strikes and the positives, you know, we're we, we kind of at, a, at an impasse here. However... Considering the responses that uh, we've had, the only reason this has come to us actually, um, if I, you know, there's no objections from you know, most of the other con uh, consultees. Um, if it were within the village framework, it wouldn't come to us. It wouldn't have come to us, more than likely. So realistically, that seems to be the main reason upon which we can refuse this application. Mm -hmm. And much as we've gone through the exercise of the pluses and the minuses, bearing in mind what we've done before, um, I think we, uh, we're left with, I think, the option of refusing it on the basis that it's outside the village framework, because everything else seems to add up. Okay. That's my view. And I, much I, as it pains me. Yes, I think, I think what we're struggling is that we can absolutely see, and I think what we're clarifying is the kind of evidence that's going to be needed to be able to um, provide the evidence for um, benefit versus harm. But anybody would like to say anything else before we move to the vote? And we would need to clarify if the vote was to approve what the re material planning reasons. And the reason we need to do this is if anybody were to object and this went to appeal, we would have to show that this committee had the material planning reasons sufficiently robust enough um, to defend our decision. Thank you, Chair. I've got one clarification, and I think that that will then determine how I vote. Um, so I'm seeking clarification from officers. If, if we believe that there is an error in that boundary, a genuine error... Huh? No, I'm, I'm saying if we... If I think that's the question she's asking. Yeah. If, 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 we, if we believe that, um, is that a material consideration that we can take in? Because then, you know, then it's... But I'd just like clarification. So you'd like clarification on, on what we have to do when we have a development framework brand in front of us? <laughs> yes. It, well, if, if we think there is a... You know, some of us may think there is a genuine error here, but is that something we can give weight to? No, Chair, what I'll say, it, it is the village framework. Um, I've got no evidence that there was an error. It's not unusual that for village frameworks to, to cut across garden land. Um, so um, I'm not, I'm, I've got no evidence there is an error. And even if there was, um, that is the village framework. That's where it is. The process for reviewing that is through the local plan process, not, not through the development management process. Could I have ask one more question? We're about to go through a local plan process. So in the local plan process, the village for Fullborn could ask for the development framework to be amended. That's correct. Yeah. I'm going to move. Um, do we have any reasons for approval that would be material planning considerations that have been heard? Um, I'm, I'm, re I'm really sorry that we just have to follow the procedure. I know, I know. It's very frustrating. Uh, Jeff, to be honest, I, I, I'm struggling. I've listened to the debate. Um, members feel that the, 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 the new dwelling would be of, of, an, of an attractive design, but that's not in itself, you know, uh, um, I, that's not a public benefit that would outweigh the, um, the, uh, the harm that's been uh, identified in heritage terms. Um, one member said that, that, that um, uh, Councillor Khan said that he didn't feel there was any harm. I mean, that is something that members... You know, could conclude, but 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 listening to the debate, I I haven't heard that um, view voiced uh, more generally. Um, so um, I think I need some help from members um, regarding the public benefit point to outweigh the harm that's been identified, and also the the material planning considerations that mean that we should depart from our normal um, framework policies in in this instance. Thanks. So, and I think what we did here was in terms of, you know, we do support, you know, local home, local family, um, you know, that, that 
and, and single dwellings. We do support that within, within villages. There was the sustainability, but not just attractive, but sustainable design. Um, the level of support, this isn't a material planning consideration, but it is in terms of the perception of harm by local residents and the parish council and the local member. We have heard that, perhaps hasn't been echoed more than Dr. Martin Khan, but I think what we haven't hear, it, the harm to the listed building, I've not heard anybody here saying there is harm to the, I would put it the other way. I think we've accepted that there's a huge amount of public perception that that is, um, that it isn't considered to be of harm. What we've been challenged by is that the planning um, rules mean that we have to therefore show public benefit and that's where we've struggled um, for, around that. So I think we, Councillor Dr. Martin Khan. Um, um, I personally feel that the, the, the development of a building using traditional materials uh, with high, high environmental benefit, and I think one could impose here much higher restrictions in terms of environmental performance than in a normal location, would be a public benefit in terms of its uh, example, providing an example for, for, for use. Um, and but we'd have to use a particular policy for that one, wouldn't we? Uh, uh, but that's, that's my personal view. Yeah. yeah. Um, good. And I think, there, you know, so I'm going to move to the, to the vote now. Conditions. Were there any conditions mentioned? Um, if, if Councillor Norris would please, we need to give some conditions. I've got a list. Yeah, do you want to? So, members, if, we, if the vote went to approval, um, conditions? Yes, so we, we, as officers, we'd ask for delegated powers to draft the conditions, but in terms of the headings that we would look to um, attach to the, the decision notice, the standard three-year planning condition, the um, uh, compliance with plans condition, um, conditions to um, relate to ecology, biodiversity, surface water drainage, contractor vehicles, secure cycle parking, um, construction management plan, delivery of goods, uh, traffic management plan, contamination, unexpected contamination, boundary treatment, 10% renewables, water efficiency, Wi-Fi, um, and then anything that's been recommended by the local highways authority. Um, and we would also remove permitted development rights um, because of the sensitive location of the site. So. Good. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to know whether it would be possible to, in exceptional circumstances, were we to uh, vote for approval, to impose a higher performance than 10% renewables. Um, that's, that's within your, your, your gift. Um, I just uh, missed a couple, I'm afraid. Um, materials, which I think has been mentioned, that would be, that would be important. And looking at the report on paragraph 61, it says that um, development has not been carefully mitigated in light of its, its proximity to the green belt. It's recommended a condition would be applied to the application for more details of its application and recommend for approval. So we draft something around, around, its, um, around that paragraph here. Yeah. Thank you. How about 61? 61. That's principally in relation to landscape. And an impact on the green belt. So that's about mitigating impact on the green belt. <coughs> Thank you. Um, members are going to go to the vote, and that is for the recommendation by the officer on page 95. And the recommendation is that the committee refuse the application for the reasons given. Um, so we move to the vote, members. Yes. Oh, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> so this one, this is about the officer's recommendation. So if you support the officer's recommendation, vote green. If you don't support and would like to overturn the officer's recommendation, then put red in, please. So that is, um, with 10 votes to one, that that has been um, refused according to the officer's recommendation. But I think we have all 
felt that that was um, there was a huge balance, and we we're very very sensitive to all of the local um, contributions and considerations that have been put forward. And, and hopefully, you'll take into consideration those that, you know what the planning system means that we have to do. And, but I think there was also some interesting things there that could be pointers to how to do that. Thank you very much. Can we have a five minute break? Is that right, Mayor Aberdeen? Thank you so much. Oh, actually, what time is. Well, what have we got here? Little Granston, the applicant South Cams. Do that one after lunch? Should we break for lunch now? Councillor Deborah Roberts, you're going to. Yeah, I usually do that at the town meeting. That's all right. But I think if we break for lunch now, I think there's a natural break, everybody. Is that okay? So we've got. Um, back at half past one. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Afternoon, everybody. Thank you. We've all had a little um, lunch break. This is the South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee, and we're resuming with agenda item eight, um, which is for land northwest of Seven Primrose Walk, Little Gransden, application number 20 slash 05251 slash for an outline application for the erection of a single self build dwelling with all matters reserved, and the applicant is South Cambridgeshire District Council. I'd like to invite um, Nigel Blaisby to say a few words about this application. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. So, um, for pragmatic reasons, this application is on the, on the agenda, and those are essentially that um, in November, this application was, was meant to be on, on the agenda, but we realised that we needed to do some additional consultations. So we undertook those additional consultations, but unfortunately, one one resident was missed off that consultation. Now, I'm, I am happy that the recommendation will ensure that um, everybody has the, the, the correct opportunity to make comments and have their views considered. Um, but I recognise that members may feel uncomfortable with the situation. So one option open to you is to defer the application if you, if you felt in that way. Um, and I just thought I'd say that at the start rather than you know, if, if, if um, there, there was a lengthy debate and, 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 and uh, it was left to the end. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Um, Chair, in light of what you said, and given the fact that this comes through to us for a transparency reason, and we are the applicant, therefore I'm assuming would be agreeable to a deferment, um, I think it's probably right that we, we do that and give whoever was missed off the opportunity to make representation. <coughs> Yeah. That, that's uh, yeah. I'm open to hear others, but that's my initial instinct. So, and we have asked the officers to consider this. So, in that um, we've had an we've had an example before where we decided to go ahead, make a decision, and if any, you know, new comments came in or new issues were raised, we would then, you know, it would come back to planning committee. Uh, but, however, what we're saying here is there is the option to, for especially for perception and transparency, that this be considered. Dr. Tim Hawkins. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it's one of the concerns that the Parish Council raised. Um, and also, I think the fact that it is our application, yep. we need to make sure that we do the best that we can. Good. So I'll put the motion forward to members. The motion is to defer this application until all of the public consultation has been concluded. By affirmation? Okay, thank you very much. We move to <coughs> agenda item nine, <coughs> which in your printed agenda pack is page 115. And this is for application 20 slash 04706 slash full application for Histon Impington Ward for 60 Impington Lane. The proposal is for the demolition of an existing garage and erection of a three-bedroom, single-storey dwelling to the rear with a detached carport store. The applicant is Mrs. S. Green. The key material considerations, flood risk, character, residential amenity and impacts. And it's being brought to the committee because it's been called in by the Parish Council and referred to the Planning Committee by the Committee Delegation Panel. Presenting officer is Phoebe Carter. Phoebe, are you there? Good afternoon. Hello, Phoebe. I'll also just note that Councillor Dr. Martin Khan, as mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, um, has removed himself as a committee member for this item and will be speaking to it as local ward member. And therefore, he is at the back of the room and he's not sitting here as committee. Thank you, Phoebe. We can see that. Thank you, Phoebe. Yes. Wonderful. So this is uh, an application for a new dwelling to the rear of 60 Impington Lane. So the site is situated um, here to the 
uh, behind the, the dwelling and the um, it's on the southwestern side of Impington Lane, which is predominantly a residential street characterised by detached dwellings situated within the development framework. There are no listed buildings within the immediate vicinity and the site falls outside of the conservation area. Um, number 60 is presently a detached residential property with a large rear garden, as you can see. Um, this is an aerial view of the um, rear amenity space, which is just situated in here. Um, so the proposal seeks planning permission for the demolition of the existing garage which is shown here on the plans. And the erection of a three bedroom single storey dwelling to the rear with a detached carport and the proposed dwelling would be accessed by a proposed driveway along the western boundary constructed from permeable paving situated along here. Um, the proposal complies with the internal space standards, building control M42 and with it and provided acceptable amenity space for the existing and proposed dwellings cycle and bin storage. Um, the dwelling by virtue of its backland location would not be prominent within the surrounding area and would have limited views from the main street. Whilst Impington Lane has a strong linear frontage to the street, there is significant backland development to the rear of the surrounding properties. Due to the constraints of the site um, and the surrounding properties, the proposed building has been kept to a single storey, which is appropriate massing and scale. The proposed materials are vertical cedar cladding with white render and a green roof. Whilst these proposed materials are not common within the area, the design is contemporary to those around it and it contrasts successfully with the surrounding context. Concerns were raised that the proposed development would be over development of the site. The garden of number 60, however, is generous in size and officers are of the view that the dwelling of this size and footprint proposed would not result in an overdevelopment. And the garden sizes are larger than set out in the design guide. Um, the proposal has been carefully designed as a single storey L-shaped building to take account of the surrounding dwellings, which can be seen here. Um, by virtue of the scale and massing, I'll just show you the elevations of the property here. So this is the proposed floor plan with the main living and dining room area set, set to the side with the sitting room to the front and bedrooms along that northeast boundary. Um, and here are the elevations with the surrounding section. This is 11 Rosalie to the rear of the site. This is the annex at number 62, and this is number 58 on the northeastern side. And so, oh no, apologies, northwestern side. So this is the side facing number 58 here. And this is the carport plans. Um, so by virtue of the scale and massing of the siting, it's not considered to give rise to any overbearing or overshadowing impact to the adjacent dwellings, but windows have been kept to a minimum on the side elevation overlooking number 58, which is shown here. And the windows on the southeastern boundary will be set as far away from the annex as at number 62 as possible. Um, these are approximately 12 metres away from the annex. Um, the application has submitted a revised flood risk assessment and drainage strategy uh, by Rossi Long Consulting. Um, the sustainable drainage officer has reviewed these submitted documents. The report has set out the proposed use of permeable paving and infiltration, which provide the SUDS technique that reduce flood risk by accepting the rainfall that would otherwise cause ponding and attenuating the rate and quality of surface water runoff from the site, improving water quality and amenity. The drainage officer has confirmed that the attenuation under the permeable surface is sufficient for the surface water. Roof water will be collected by a traditional gutter and downpipe system and directed into the sub-base of the new permeable paving system. In addition, the applicants proposed the existing driveway to the frontage of number 60 is also proposed to be replaced with permeable paving, which will be linked to the new area of the permeable paving to the rear. Doing so will effectively prevent uncontrolled flows from the frontage running off site into the highway and larger rainfall events, which is likely scenario within the current arrangement. So the drainage officer is confident that the calculations provided within the report are correct. 
Whilst the concerns regarding drainage are noted, the technical advice submitted within the report and expert advice received from the drainage officer have been refused, reviewed and a refusal based on drainage grounds, in their opinion, would not be justified. So officers therefore recommend approval of the application subject to the attached conditions. Um, I'd also like to point out that in the report it stated that there was an Anglian Water uh, informative, which wasn't initially attached, which will need to be attached onto the report. Thank you. Can you explain what that would say? Um, it would be about the drainage system connecting to the current Anglian water surface runoff into their foul water drainage system. Thank you. Um, if we move now to um, Dr. Simon Goddard. And I understand you're with us virtually. Hello, I am Goddard. indeed. Hello there. And I understand Hello. also John Gooch is with us as well. Chair, if I may, John has sent his apologies. He's unable to make it. That's fine. OK. Um, so, Dr. Goddard, you know the procedure. I hope you've got three minutes. Um, we'll be timing and be hurt by Nigel in terms of the timekeeping. But... Um, no pressure. Just take it deep breath and take it easy. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do. I'll do my best. I do Thank have you. some um, images that I'd like to show as well, and I think they've been already shared. So I don't know if it's possible to. So to yes, show so Phoebe, would you be when on instruction? Would you be able to show the slides that Dr. Goddard likes? Um, do you want to yeah. start with one already? Um, no, it's, it's 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 okay. I'll make a make a start then. So I'm I'm, I'm talking on behalf of. All the all the neighbours um, in the around the around the proposed development site. Um, so, Histon and Impington Parish Council and the residents of all the neighbouring properties have rejected the proposed development at Number 60 Impington Lane. All the relevant details for the objections are in the documents and letters which have been submitted. The development is far too large for a back garden and would severely impact the privacy of neighbours particularly those at number 62, where the proposed development would be extremely close to the existing annex. In addition, a large low-level chim chimney on the proposed property is unacceptable. It is also noted that the purpose of the building remains unclear in terms of whether it is a family house or a multi-tenancy. The main point of contention is that the drainage in the area has still not been adequately as assessed. The area where the proposed house is intended collects water from the surrounding area, including specially constructed land drains, and this soaks into a large drainage ditch on the garden of the landowner of number 60. There is no mention of this drainage ditch on any of the surveys which have been conducted, but it runs along the boundary of number 58, and I think perhaps you can show, show the image of that, please, and in winter fills with water. The proposed build is a few metres from the ditch and runs alongside the ditch for most of its length. This will prevent water entering the drainage ditch and water will build up elsewhere and would not be drained away. Pictures of the drainage ditch and of flooding where the intended build, build is have been provided and members of Histon Impington Parish Council have viewed the ditch and considered the drainage in the area as part of the reason for rejecting the application. Furthermore, the landowner is responsible for maintenance of the ditch and access would be severely limited by a house in such close proximity. Since being fenced off by the landowner, which was to prevent children accessing the ditch, the ditch seems to have been forgotten. If the development goes ahead, the flooding currently encountered by neighbouring properties will become a major issue. This has already been demonstrated when the annex at number 62 was built and which caused considerable, considerable water build-up in the neighbouring properties of Rosalie and resulted in expensive drainage, drainage schemes to try to alleviate the problem. But even then, flooding can still occur in these properties. The problem would be greatly exacerbated if development at number 60 is granted. Landowner has no, made no attempt to discuss the proposed building with any of the neighbours and is unaware of the boundary between 58 and 60, which differs from one plan to another. It seems strange that alternatives such as downsizing or selling the excess land to neighbours to use as a garden have not been considered, which would help maintain the important ecology in the area. We therefore hope that all the important points will be considered and investigated and the planning application rejected. 
you can see the first image there, which is um, flooding on the land, which occurred um, last, last winter. And the image below it is some pictures of the drainage ditch, which runs belong, be, sorry, runs beside the property. And you can see the water collects in, in there and is drained away on, on, onto the main road. If you could scroll down, please. And we've finished the three minutes. It is just explaining the slide. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So this this is the area where the where the flooding flooding occurs and where the water collects. There's another image of the drainage ditch and shows where the ditch is in relation to where the where the property is on the on on the bottom bottom image. And just I think there's just one or two. Just if you scroll down again, please. And this shows that the boundary and some plans. It's one thing, and then the other plans. It's another thing. Okay. Whereas the one, one on the left hand side is correct. I'll finish thank now. You. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much, um, <laughs> Dr. Goddard, and I'll open it up for any questions from members. Okay. Councillor Dr. Tony Hawkins. Thank you, Chair. I think I got a bit confused about which house had the drain, the ditch next to it. Can we clarify that? Dr. Goddard, you can answer that question. Yep. It's um it's it runs between number fifty-eight and number sixty. So and number sixty is the applicant application. So perhaps if we have can we have a diagram, please? Yeah. You showed that in one of your slides, Dr. Goddard? Yes, that's correct. Um if you scroll up, please. So, yeah, it's on this one here. So, number number fifty eight is on the on the left hand side, and the, you can see where the ditch is. And number sixty is um, obviously the area in, highlighted in red. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, sir. I just wondered, do we know anything about the low level chimney? And you know, would it would it be actually intent to use that? Um, would it be a log burning stable? What would it be? I mean, I, I, it doesn't look nearly tall enough to function properly as a chimney to me, but um, what's your opinion on that? Do, Dr. Goddard, do you want to answer? Do you know anything you were saying, the sort of um, concerns about the chimney? Yes, well, I, I see on the plans that the chimney looks quite large. I assume, I don't know. What it's meant to burn. I'm yeah, assuming I think it's, it's meant to be some open, 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 open fire. Um, but uh, if, if that is the case, then it's going to cause a lot of pollution in the area because it's not, not very tall. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you have any other questions for Dr. Goddard? A um, question from me, Dr. Goddard, would be when you mentioned that there's um, there have been previous instances, you said, from the building of the annex, which is neighbouring to this application, um, had caused... Was that found? Was there evidence to show that the flooding damage to neighbouring properties had come from the, the impact on runoff from that? I, I would need to check the exact details, but I know that the properties on Rose Lee, which is the road behind behind the property have particularly one or two of them when the annex was built number 62 did suffer more more flooding i'm not an expert and i don't know exactly why that was the case but it, it did happen at the same time and some of those properties have now invested a lot of money to um put in drainage schemes to to cope with that and the, the concern is that if the water is not going to be drained away by this ditch anymore which looks quite possible then that's where the water is going going to end up good thank Thanks. you very much so and thank you for your time um and we'll now move to the agent rob preston who's here with us in person and i understand that also paul cosford drainage consultant and you're going to divide your time uh, yes so you have one and a half minutes each and I understand we're going to do a little dance so we'll stop after your one yeah. and a half minutes and then bring in um, Mr Cosford yes thank you very much and yeah. you understand the procedure that you know how to use yeah. it thank you very That's much fine. yeah okay
Uh, good afternoon, members. Uh, the objective of this application scheme is to develop a single dwelling to help to meet local housing needs within a sustainable location. The site is located within the development framework of a rural centre and therefore the development accords with policies S7 and S8 of the local plan, which supports the principle. As the case officer states in paragraph 22, there are examples in the surrounding area of buildings set back from the road, which is a feature of the uh, local pattern of development. The proposed dwelling has been carefully designed in terms of siting scale and appearance that preserves local character. The dwelling, uh, the dwelling is modest in scale and height and is situated within a large plot and then it enables a good degree of separation from the boundaries whilst also retaining sufficient garden space. The design and placement of windows avoids overlooking and overshadowing. The, the, the development is therefore acceptable in terms of neighbouring and occupier residential amenity. The proposed development has been formed by a suite of uh, supporting assessments on access, trees, ecology and flood risk and drainage and, support, and is supported by the Council's technical consultees. The scheme will also deliver biodiversity enhancements including a green roof, native planting and other measures outlined in the uh, preliminary ecological appraisal. The details can be controlled for the condition. The, the building is designed to high standards of insulation and incorporates solar panels, solar water heating and electrical vehicle charging. We support the recommendations of the planning officer and her assessment of the scheme. The proposed development will deliver several planning benefits um, and it accords with the development plan. Thanks very much. Thank you. I think we'll hear both first and then we'll go to questions. If you can sit nearby, then we can have answers from both. Good afternoon, members. Good afternoon. Uh, I hope to clarify <coughs> the surface with drainage design used on the site. Um, the main point to note is that the site will be self-contained in terms of surface water drainage in the sense that the drainage solution does not rely on the ditch or any other off-site connection. The proposal is to collect all runoff from the new and existing roofs and driveways and infiltrate to the ground. The site is located in Flood Zone 1, which is defined as land having a flood risk of less than 1 in 1,000 from rivers in the sea. The principal consideration is therefore management of surface water runoff. The environment agency flood maps do indicate ponding in the rear gardens in the 100 year scenario. And as discussed, this is the location of the new building and driveway. In the post development scenario, the design will capture this water and direct it elsewhere. Rainfall on the new development at the rear of the site will be directed into a stone blanket beneath the permanent block paving for temporary storage and conveyance to the front of the existing building. The rear of the site, the current garden area, is located over clay subgrade, which is virtually impermeable. However, the front of the site is located over sands and gravels, which is permeable. Site testing was undertaken to establish infiltration rates and the design developed to accommodate the volumes generated by all storm events up to and including the 100 year event, plus a 40% additional allowance for climate change. The surface water drain solution therefore meets the requirements of national planning policy framework and the lead local authorities flood criteria, the latter having approved the proposals as suitable. And thank you. That's my statement. Thank you. That is your time. Thanks very much both of you managing to do that within the time. Um, questions, Dr. Tumi Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and through you. Um, Mr. Cosford, I think if I heard you correctly, you said the front of the site is on permeable soil and the back where the proposed building is going to be is on non-permeable clay soil. Correct. That's a big difference in types of soil on what is a short. <laughs> yes, um, there is a clay, there's a clay sand gravel horizon uh, to the rear of the existing property. So uh, the entire frontage and the existing building uh, is on sands and gravels, and that is the existing building's uh, drainage regime. It's, uh, it's, it's using soakaways. I'm sorry, it just seems to me that the different types of soil on the same plot seems is to be quite different. I mean, there's a, this is a big difference. Yeah, there was a, there's a, the clay is, the, is basically the subgrade, and it arises uh, to the rear of the building. 
to, to the front, you have the superficial sands and gravels. Mm. That makes a big difference to drainage, of course. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And so I, I would like to ask a question, please. Um, uh, Councillor Harvey, Councillor Clough. Yes, I just wonder if I could address my previous question. Um, what would be the use of the low-level tuna? Perhaps that would be to Mr. Preston. Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? The use of the chimney. What's 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 proposed for the use of the chimney? Uh, well, the chimney uh, serves the living room. So, um, whilst it's not been you know, uh, confirmed in absolute. Um, it does serve a fireplace, so therefore, um, you know, it could be a, for example, a wood, wood burning stove, um, for example. Um, but I think the officer has addressed this in the report in terms of what um, can be considered as a material consideration in regards to chimneys. So. Yeah. Thank you. Good. And I have a question, one for you, and and then one for Mr. Cosford, if that's okay. Okay. Um, so it would be, could you just clarify um, the the level of engagement and consultation with neighbours that has happened prior to the application being submitted? Um, I mean, as, as it is for a single dwelling, it's, um, it's, it's obviously been subject to the, the normal uh, statutory consultation requirements as part of the planning application. Um, uh, and, uh, but otherwise, there's been no um, uh, specific pre-application engagement. Which, which often is really quite good, even though we can have the biggest conflicts among the single dwellers. But I, I do understand. I'm, I'm hearing you. Okay. And then, um, Mr. Cosford, in terms of the drainage, can you explain why there is no um, mention or consideration of the drainage ditch and its function, given that you've, you've given the characterisation of the soils? Yeah, we. The, the, there's no um, proof that the drainage ditch has a positive outfall. Um, we weren't, the AW, I'll bring the AW comment into this, we were not permitted to discharge any surface water from the site into the AW sewer at the front of the property in Lindington Road. If the ditch is connected into the, the sewer, which will be a combined sewer, we wouldn't have been permitted to discharge into it in any case. So we had to, we had to uh, formulate a solution which was self-contained within the plot. But, but again, there's no, why no mention of it in the new, because it serves a function, yeah? It, well, it, it has may, served a function. Well, it, it, yeah, the, it's not, we don't think it's, uh, it forms a continuous link with anything. We think it's a, a kind of a, an ad hoc ditch which has been uh, put in there to take up a certain volume of runoff from the rear areas of the properties and so jet grew very slowly into the ground, but it, there is no link shown on any uh, information that we could find. So we, we then went into a ground investigation and discovered that we had uh, infiltration available on site. Okay, thank so we you. We went down that route. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkin. Um, thank you, Chairman. Just to follow your uh, question there, uh, Mr. Cosford, you said that you couldn't find any information um, about this ditch. Did you actually trace it? Did you trace no, it on the ground or were you just relying on there, documentation no, that was we available? Went, there are ditches in uh, Impington further to the west. There's quite a uh, significant ditch network to the west which is mapped and that is linked together and that does form a uh, drainage for some of the village but it does not extend down Impington Road. So this is an isolated ditch um, and given the fact that the only uh, outlet for it could be a sewer, which we were not permitted to discharge into. Um, it was not. It did not. It's not form part of the. Okay, let me and stop you. And I'm it's sorry. Not an infiltration. Did you trace solution. it? Did you trace it? No, we didn't trace it. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, any further questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. And you. um, we don't have anybody from the parish council, but we do have local member councillor Dr. Martin Khan. This site lies in the rear garden of a vicarage in the village of Impington. 
the property has a large garden with extensive rather unmanaged lawns and a few fruit, fruit trees. To the east of the garden lies a drainage ditch which no longer discharges and fills to its brim in rainy weather. The area represents a significant area of greenery which backs onto more densely developed a more densely developed area to the south. To prevent, prevent loss of privacy to adjoining properties, the proposed property has been restricted to one storey to occupy a larger floor area which is completely covered by an impermeable roof. To counter drainage concerns, the applicant has proposed the use of sustainable drainage by the use of permeable hard standing. Much of the area to be developed currently is liable to flood in extreme weather, as indicated by the high risk of surface water flooding indicated on the national flood map. The water eventually drains to the adjoining drain, but this, in itself, this itself is reported not to evacuate effectively. It has been suggested to me that the ditch formerly discharged to the north, but has been filled in for but um, for whatever reason, the impermeable nature of the ground prevents the clearance of the ditch and it has been reported to fill it to the brim. The site is underlain by gort clay, which is highly impermeable and causes water to be retained. Where with mixed with some sand, it is reputed to be slightly permeable, but the evidence of a completely full ditch suggests that even in the present conditions, it is not able to evacuate effectively to the north. The evidence from recent development to the north of the Dignan Lane is that the soil is very impermeable and difficult to drain. The development of Hunter's Lane in the last two years has led to very slight changes in ground level, and this has caused the previously draining garden of number 75, opposite number 60, to become waterlogged in wet weather, when it previously did not become so because the water, uh, become so, because the water cannot evacuate through the impermeable ground under lane by Gort Clay. It is feared that this large area of permeable hard standing, um, with, with this uh, large area of permeable hard standing, surface water will seep down and be retained in this permeable material, but not be able to seep away in the impermeable clay beneath. After prolonged rain, the hard standing material would displace water that previously stood on the garden, and in fact, the storage capacity for surface water will be reduced. With increased discharge in extreme conditions, for instance, when the area has already become waterlogged, it is feared that the ditch to the west will be more likely to fill and overflow, as it cannot evacuate in a similar manner to the problems that have arisen in the garden of number 75, where standing water cannot evacuate. Furthermore, the replacement of the garden area by hard standing will replace vegetation with a mineral surface over more than half of the surface area of the plot. It is difficult to see how this level of de development can be considered to increase the biodiversity of the plot by 10%, and so the concern expressed by local residents that the area is becoming less natural would seem to be justified. Therefore, I ask the members to reject this proposal due to the fact that it aggravates the risk of flooding and because of the resultant loss of biodiversity and green space in this green area of the village. Thank you. Perfect timing. It was the practice. Thank you, members. Do we have any questions for the local member? Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and through you. Um, Councillor Dr. Karen, uh, please, obviously, you've uh, read the report and paragraph 54 um, talks about not being uh, and that re sorry, refusal on the grounds of drainage is not appropriate. Could not be justified, sir. Cannot be justified, beg your pardon. Um, whereas what we've heard so far seems to suggest that there are still issues with drainage. Can you comment on that, please? Uh, I know. From, I know from talking to local residents that there is a, a, a real problem. I'm unconvinced that if you place material which is permeable um, on an area where water is retained, uh, that you will have adequate um, means for... It seems to me that then you will just displace some of the water that's not, is currently retained. If the area underneath is impermeable, if, then you will replace some of the water that is presently retained in. In fact, you may aggravate the problem because the water will fill up more rapidly. Some of it will currently be filled by permeable hard standing. Um, and therefore, I'm, I'm concerned that the effect will be that in, after prolonged rain, when uh, the area is already water, the permeable hard standing is already waterlogged because it can't drain away because of the impermeable layer underneath, it will actually more, be more likely to overfill into the, into the ditch rather than less likely. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, one more thing, if I may. Um, during your uh, talk, you mentioned, I think it's number 75, opposite. I wasn't quite clear what the 
what was happening there between 68 and 70. When the, uh, the development north of, uh, north of Indington Lane, which came to committee here, you, you, you consider, uh, was developed, um, the level of the, the work drainage conditions, but after the, afterwards, this didn't really include conditions for dealing with adjoining properties. And adjoining properties to uh, the south of the site, which in fact is slightly higher than the, the area where it's draining to, um, previous, uh, had problems of flooding on the off in the garden, uh, um, particularly this year. Um, so that areas which previously had been dry became flooded with water. And uh, this is presumed to be because the level was raised perhaps by six, uh, six, uh, six inches or, or so to the north. It's a very flat area, and that was sufficient to prevent it the area to dissipate and because the area is underlain by gold clay it can't it can't soak into the ground uh, and therefore this is a similar area it's almost almost a, exactly a similar area to the area that you're on the evidence from previous experiences in the vicinity suggests that it's going to be very difficult to get disposed of the, this water um, and uh, i'm expressing some hesitation that the proposal will actually resolve the problem from experience in, in, in the vicinity Thank you, Councillor Cam. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. No. Any more questions? No. Thank you very much. So, members, we will go to the debate. And maybe, maybe I can start off. So, I think the, the benefits of this to, to be using um, the land to provide that additional house. We are in a village which is completely hem sort of surrounded now by green belt and we've done almost all of the any potential infill that can happen. So for people building local build for a local home, it, it you know this is important. Um, the fact that there's consideration by making it one story, single story, um, is sensitive to um, to the neighbours and to the um, other buildings that have the, the back like the annex and neighbouring properties. However, what that then does um, in our consideration is, as Councillor um, Dr. Martin Khan has said, is it means that this takes up a much greater area of the land that they're building on to be able to provide. Now, we've got a very difficult situation here where we're being advised that we've been told by our statutory consultees on technical grounds that any doubts regarding drainage issues um, are not justified because our statutory consultees have told us that this shouldn't be a problem. The context for Histon and Impington is that a recent development um, that is uh, happening in the same area has now had the head of economic development and planning from the Greater Cambridge Planning. It has had our CEO, Liz Watts, visit personally the people that have been impacted in neighboring properties from developments that the statutory consultee said met drainage conditions. And they're still dealing with that. And they're dealing with an audit of the amount of damage this has caused to the neighboring properties. And it's exactly this that Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins asked this question about the change. It's because this area, the characterization, is right on the edge of that change into that, that flood line. Something is happening in terms of the capacity of that area to deal with the increased um, weather conditions and the flooding. It's not doing well. We've had backup in terms of the surge capacity. We've been dealing with that as other villages. So the whole capacity of the area we're finding is, is becoming much, much more stressed. And, and, and this is probably as a result of climate change. And what I find very difficult is perhaps our planning rules are not fit for purpose yet, you know, to, to actually catch up with the climate change situation. Um, but I do think that we, you know, I will ask officers on this one, but having been, having been local ward members in a village that has had to deal with um, applications that have then, even though they've had statutory consultees on the local flood authority and our drainage officers saying this is sufficient, it hasn't been sufficient. And that's just in the recent year. And it's in exactly the same area, kind of the area that we're considering. So this is very difficult because we've got to look at this application. And we've, had, we've been told it's not justified, but you know, I support all the principles of this development, but I do, cons I'm knowing, and the people who are developing this know those situations. So I would have expected perhaps far more investigation of, the, of what's happening, the drainage ditch that's there, just to be able to, 
to show that we've done even more, um, yeah, the, the necessary investigation to do, be more than doubly sure that there isn't a risk here. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the I think the drainage issue is is being quite well explored and explained. Um, but but equally, we do have in the report, as you say, it says, um, and if if we were minded to go down that route, then obviously we have to accept that there's a, a high risk of um, of that being overturned. Um, so I am going to steer my comments away from drainage, though that doesn't mean I don't appreciate the, the issues that have been raised. So I'm looking at page 25 of our plan pack, sorry, on the online one, I think, um, so that's not the agenda, but the plans that have been described. So I don't know if it's possible to have that displayed. Mm -hmm. um, Bibi, have you got you there? So do you know which one it's being referred to? I'm just bringing it up. I'm not sure which one it refers to. Do you have a figure number or something like that? Uh, it doesn't have a figure number. It's just page 25 of the pro a proposed site plan. Proposed site plan. Maybe. Yeah, that, that one. Oh, no, that's a block plan, but that equally will do the same mm -hmm. job. Um, so I appreciate there is an annex at the rear of 62, but, but a big part of an annex is it's, it's not a separate dwelling. Um, so and it has to be connected to the main building itself. So I don't see the development being on par with, with its neighbouring property on, in that respect. I do also look at the footprint. You'll see the annex is very much smaller, even though the distances are the same. The footprint of this dwelling, like you say, probably because it's single storey, is the majority of it. I mean, there's there's not much for garden and residential amenity. I'm looking for the future residents of that property. Um, you know, they're going to have very little manoeuvrability or, or, or quality, actually, I think, in, in that area. 12 metres next to the annex as well. I mean, that that's close. While I appreciate the height's not there, they're it almost makes me think if they were to go into their garden, that they're almost on three sides cornered in. It's almost like a, like a, you know, courtyard. Um, so while I appreciate the drainage things, for me there are other things with this site which I'm not particularly happy with. Um, and I do wonder if it's overdevelopment so, in that area. So with, in the report it says it, it doesn't support an overdevelopment, which is what local people have said. But if we, maybe Phoebe, you could help. On paragraph 24, um, having heard Councillor Heather Williams, it says here that there's a good retained garden. Um, can you explain There is that? to the vicarage, Chair, but not to the future residents of the future dwelling. If I'm not looking at what's retained with the vicarage. I'm looking at what the future residents of that property to the rear are going to have. Because we have to think of the future residents, not just the current ones. Yep. Phoebe? So the rear garden of the new dwelling is 186 metres squared, and the garden retained within the vicarage is 160 metres squared, both which are above what is set out in the design guide. The, the Histon Impton Village design guide? Uh, no, the, the design guide from 2010. Trying to do the square root of 160, if you could bear with. So that's kind of policy. So if it's within policy, if it's policy compliant for a garden area. But I think your point. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not. It's not just with the garden area though, on that policy. You've got so that's 12 by 12, which is you know that's not even. It's not even this room, I don't think probably. Um, but it's the fact that the annex being so close creates sort of you've got walls on three sides but it's not a small garden looking out or anything like that I, I do you know look at that and think that's a house crammed in okay. to a small plot that is my I, I think the what's been retained with the vicarage is is substantial but I I do fear for the quality of the future residents of the rear property Thank quality you. of life um council dr Toomey hawkins Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think 
Councillor Heather Williams actually has um, said one of the things I wanted to talk about, which is I think there's overdevelopment on that side. It's a postage stamp garden for what is a large three bedroom um, uh, dwelling. Um, but I'm also still very concerned about the drainage. And whilst I note that paragraph that I read out earlier on, mm -hmm. I am not convinced that the drainage scheme that's been proposed uh, will do the job. I'm sorry. Um, if the applicants, agents, uh, drainage people cannot even bother to trace a ditch that's right on their plot, um, <laughs> how should I know that the modeling that's been done actually does do the work that they say it will do? I mean, we in my village, I know, have challenged um, reports from uh, consultants in the past, and we found it to be wrong. And they've had to go back and change it. So, um, in my view, I, I will not be supporting this, I'm sorry. There's just way too much risk um, that other neighboring uh, properties will be affected by what I think is an insufficient drainage plan, as well as the fact that I think it's too big for the plot. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask for a question of officers, just to, as we're looking at reasons, you know, there to be reasons to overturn officer recommendation, would be, um, if that's overdevelopment, and it's policy compliant, but if it's a, you know, a view of overdevelopment, how does that stand in terms of reasons? Madam Chair, we could, um, we could uh, phrase it in a way that it, um, the proposal is of a site in footprint and scale such that it would appear out of keeping with the prevailing character and appearance of the local area. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Oh, no. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. I won't repeat what everyone said about drainage, but I, I, I share the same um, concerns. I just I want to go back to this question of the size of the gardens. Uh, uh, um, can I get some clarification on that plan we just saw? Because I, I find it difficult to believe that the garden in the annex is bigger than the retained garden in the vicarage. It just looks significantly smaller, whereas the, the, the planning report back says that, um, as the officers just said, that the rear garden of the new dwelling is 186 metres squared. The retained garden is 160 squared. I, I just can't make that fit with that map. I think it was 168. Uh, Phoebe, can you give us the dimensions again and just show us with your laser where the garden bits are? Yes, yeah, so the garden of um, the new dwelling, it slightly changed by the paving around the house. So it's taken up to the boundary and then to the rear walls and side elevations of the house. So you include the gray area here, as well as the green and the hedging that's uh, surrounding it, which does, when you look at it, it and you look at the green area, it looks smaller, but then you have to take into account um, the paving directly outside the house and also the, the up to the boundary fence yeah. where obviously in the vicarage they've not shown any boundary hedging or paving areas so it, it looks it looks proportionally different but when measured it, it comes out as those figures thank you chair thank you um, based on, on that, and I, I was taking that in, that we're in the calculations, that was part of my fear that we're including these little tiny thin strips that circle around, which is essentially a boundary just so you can do any maintenance on those sides of the walls or class it as garden, personally. Um, I then would have issue with um, actually the landscaping and the design of it and whether I think that actually something could be, could be managed. I mean, it, it's, there is... It's tiny. So I think we've got, we've got here size, footprint and scale, if that would be a you know, reason. So I think that's, that's good. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, well, I also got concerns on the drainage. And I, the um, representatives for Africa were describing what seemed to be this transition from clay to gravel. They seem to be describing that as if it were a kind of quite extensive soak away, in other words, a sort of 
sustainable drainage system from a, a kind of a former period, I suppose, a bit like you might put a tank there these days, one of these um, cellular tanks, but I, I guess the advantage of that is, if there is an advantage, is that you're creating a, a body of space where water can accumulate during a period of heavy rainstorm, but uh, heavy, heavy rainfall, but still, um, the, the long-term capacity for infiltration um, is not affected by that. That's just a temporary storage of water. I mean, the infiltration rate in the long term um, is the infiltration rate of the clay underneath the site um, per cubic, uh, per, per square meter, times the square meter of the site. But in building this very um, large floor area new development, you've effectively, I would say, reduced the infiltration rate of this, the site as a whole by 25%. That's quite a lot. So, you know, I, I, I would really um, have concerns that in a period of sustained rain, rainfall that this would not have an effect not only on the site but also on the neighbouring site. So I, I would have concerns. Okay, and I have one more. And so what I think is, I think the difference is it, it, this is being put forward as a scheme that in a self contained scheme within that. And I think that the, what we have seen in that same area is it's not sufficient because of the, um, the extreme conditions in, in that area. And so um, I'm going to ask now that we go to the vote, if that's okay. I would like to check with um, Nigel what would be reasons for refusal. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, certainly, the site in footprint and scale, um, that would be appropriate. I would advise against the drainage reason for refusal on the basis that the relevant consultee and expert has looked at the evidence um, and come to a conclusion that it, it is acceptable. Um, we, we know there's been some flooding nearby, but, but we don't know the full nature of that. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the relevant experts haven't given us the advice. So I would advise against that. Um, Do you want me to? I would like to include it. Okay. Because I think we're getting to a situation where if we don't, we're, we're, going, we're being blind to the situation. And maybe we need, you know, if there is an appeal, then we need it to be properly investigated as an appeal. Because we can't be unfair to applicants, but we also have to make sure that we're, we're having the proper investigation. So I, I would, I, well, I would like to see it included. <laughs> Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. We did have an application recently, actually, where we um, went against the, the officer's advice on drainage. Um, I'm not sure if, we've ha if there's been an appeal or anything from that. I think the, there has to be an element of what Councillor Haylings is saying that I... I thoroughly respect the advice we've just been given, um, Mr. Blaisby, and, and in your reasons for doing that. But there is an element of, if we don't try, we'll never know. I think that's also, you know, available here. Um, and I think this isn't, this isn't one issue that we're refusing this application on. I also have an issue with the potential residential amenity for new residents in, in that as well, if we, if we could take a look at that. Um, but I would seek your reassurance that I think we all appreciate that there is an element of risk in, in refusing on the drainage. I think we have to accept that based on the report. Um, but that in that situation, it's not a case of they all have to apply or none. If it goes to appeal and an inspector said no to the drainage, then there are still the other, other reasons. Um, or is it a case of if we get one wrong, then then it all gets thrown out. So just your advice on that, because I think that then may um, alleviate the concern for officers and us that you've uh, got a plan B. Uh, through you, Chair. I think the, the drainage reason is, is unlikely to be um, supported at appeal, I would, I would say. Um, I think an inspector would, would consider that um, the the relevant expert has given us the advice mm -hmm. um, and on what basis are we going against that. Um, the other reason of refusal I think is more subjective and I think um, you know, that, that is, is appropriate. But, but members, it's your decision and my colleague Toby Williams has drafted a couple of but reasons. I think the, the, the question was, 
is it disadvantageous? Do, does, do, all the, do all the reasons for refusal have to be approved by the, by the inspector? No, the no, no, not, that was not, the question. Not, stop, my, my apologies. No, not at all. No, the inspector may, may well disagree with that reason, but then we'll look at the other reasons. And, and the, it, it doesn't affect the, um, the, the weight that an inspector might give to uh, other reasons. Stephen, yeah. but you. I think there is an important point that, uh, Chair, you mentioned, which is that there have been uh, examples where the statutory consultee on other schemes has said it's all OK, but the proof of the pudding is actually they got it wrong. Yep. And therefore, I would support your wish to see drainage included because it would then allow the inspector to go... Um, are we satisfied that, that having got the advice wrong on other schemes that we just have to follow blindly mm -hmm. their advice on this scheme? So I think there is a, a case uh, acknowledging that there is a risk uh, that if the other reasons get chucked out that there may be um, an application for costs on the drainage one because it's not supported by um, technical evidence at, at, at this stage. The alternative that you may wish to consider uh, is um, if you were minded to refuse, um, is the applicant, would the applicant prefer to take a deferment to um, provide further evidence that the drainage isn't the, the issue, so mm -hmm. that they could come back and say, we've heard your concerns, here is additional drainage evidence that we would ask you to have regard to before you issue a refusal which includes a drainage condition. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, so I just want to come back, so obviously I, I raised that question. Um, so I, I hear what um, Mr. Reid is saying about deferment. I think if drainage was the only issue, then I would support that course of action. But even if the drainage was sorted, in my mind, it's still a refusal on the other grounds. Thank you. Um, and I, I would move that we, we refuse on those and, and, and move to the vote on refusing on those grounds, accepting you know, there is potential risk on that. But I think we're at a point now where we, we need to accept that risk and, and proceed. So if members were minded to refuse this, are you in agreement that we include the drainage? Yes. Everybody? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. So as I said, my colleague Toby Williams has drafted a couple of um, reasons. So the first is the proposal lies partly within an area that is susceptible to surface water flooding. The proposal has failed to justify that it would not exacerbate existing surface water flooding issues to land or property. As such, the proposal is contrary to policy CC9 of the South Kentshire Local Plan 2018 and National Planning uh, NPPF Parallel 159. And the second reason of refusal is the proposal is of a sighting footprint and scale such that it would appear out of keeping with the prevailing character and appearance of the local area and as such would appear cramped and represent an overdevelopment of the site. As such, the proposal is contrary to uh, South Council Local Plan 2018 policies HQ1 and H16 and NPPF and NPPG guidance on good design. Okay. Thank you. Um, members, so I have got Council Dr. Tim Hawkins and Judith Ripith, Council Judith Ripith, down to speak. If there's a new item you want to bring up or a new consideration, otherwise we could go to the vote. Councillor Judith Ripper, I see there is something you would like to say. I know. Can I just check? Is the order in which the hierarchy of that important? Because the drainage you're saying is the weaker reason. Is it better to switch those, or will the inspector not take that into account at all? And through you, Chair, it, it makes no difference at all. So the inspector will look at each reason of refusal, and, and in fact, the inspector will look at the scheme as a whole, actually. Um, yeah, thanks. I just wanted to no. completely double check. Thank you. Um, can we go to the vote, Councillor Dr. Um, yes, I was just going to support your request to um, ah, okay. put in the drainage. I'm sorry, but we have at the point where we need to deal with our drainage issues. It's just getting worse in the district. Sorry. I'm yeah. Thank you very much. So, members, um, we
We are looking at the recommendation on page 125, the printed pack. So officers are recommending that we ap approve the application. So that means if you press green, you want to approve the application. If you press red, you are um, going against the officer recommendation for a refusal. So we've got one more. It's you. Is that me? Yeah. <laughs> oh no, that's wrong. I've done it wrong. I pressed the wrong one. Press the middle one. You can you can redo your yes. Done. Is that done? Done. Yeah. We only nine. Yeah, we, Deborah Deborah's and Martin's over there. Thank you. <laughs> So, members, that with a eight to one, that has been refused. Um, thank you. Agenda item 10 has been withdrawn. So we move to agenda item 11, which is enforcement. Councillor Tina Hawkins. Uh, do you want to note that Councillor Dr. Richard Williams has just left the building? Thank you. He had mentioned to me that he may need to leave. So that's he's on he's on the pickup run, school pickup today. Um, and for enforcement, hello there. Hello, Chair. How are we all? We're good. We just we lost you just suddenly. Oh, there you are. There you are. So yes. Thanks very much. So any any updates? Yeah, just one brief verbal update on the Hayden Way development at Willingham. Um, over the last few days, we've had a report uh, regarding utility works outside of the Red Edged area, obviously causing some concern with parking um, from residents. We just need to clarify that it, it's not a district council matter. Um, utilities can dig up roads and carry out works uh, without contacting us. However, they possibly should have notified the highways uh, and neighbours probably should have been updated via them. Um, but it's just clarified that it's not a district council matter. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions on the enforcement report? Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. And those of us that have been on planning for some time will appreciate my comments when I say I'm about to channel Councillor Nick Wright and talk about um, the Smithy Fen uh, application. I, I see that you're saying that we're, we're getting to some form of conclusion again with another report. Um, but this, this has been ongoing for a very long period of time now. Um, and is there, you know, will, is this just going to be another trench of another round and cycle of things? Or do we actually think we've got a chance of resolving this? Because, because I can understand how local residents would feel incredibly frustrated at this point, almost as a committee member, you know, it, it's always there and we seem to struggle to address it. Um, so how, how close are we to conclusion on this? Um, and have we been including those local residents um, in this process? Will they, will they get to contribute? Because obviously it's, it's something that's highly emotive in, in the area. Yeah, so if I can update Councillor from the planning side uh, from, unfortunately it's a whole multi-agency approach that we're going to have to take um, at this site we've got very different departments that have their own interests in the site and thinking of the knock-on effect uh, for each service all i can say from the enforcement side is we, we've got our take we've submitted our information to the overall enforcement undertaking for the site um, we're waiting to be told what we, what the next stage will be, uh, whether we'll be serving planning contravention notices to everybody on the whole site, um, or what that next step will look like. As soon as I have been told, um, I will be notifying members. Unfortunately, I, I can't give any more information until we're, we're led further. Can I can I ask you to share that with us, and that is appreciated. But we'll be sharing, obviously, with the local residents and, and the parishes as well, have you? Because you know th this isn't a case of weeks or months. This is years. I mean, we must get close to a decade soon. Got me. 
Yes, uh, it's took me a lot of reading uh, on this site. We had to catch up to date with it. Um, but yes, as soon as we, I've been directed and I have a way forward, I will update the parish councils as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Eileen Wilson, before Councillor Jeff Harvey. If that would be. Thank you, Chair. It's because I wanted to speak on the same topic. Um, I, I'm the local uh, member for Cottenham, and the, the question of Smithy Fen, as you know, has been filling our inboxes for quite some time. I'm grateful for the work that the officers have been carrying out with um, Ivy Legal, and I, I'm really looking forward to the results when we get final decisions. But in the meantime, the residents are still very concerned that I had another communication this morning because there was a, a report in the East Anglian Daily Time about um, an incident that took place at Red Lodge, which resulted in um, transient um, members of the traffic community being arrested in Cottenham by um, an armed response unit. The, these incidents become intimidating, and this is, this is what the residents actually see, that they see the incidents of criminal activity which they then associate with the site and it actually some of the residents at the site really detest that they all get a bad name because of the actions of a few so what i would ask is when we do have the outcome of this um, report and decisions are being made that there is a public meeting for the village because they have been waiting a very very long time to have some sort of solution on this issue and that's what i had to say thank you yeah no thank you councillor I'll, I'll make a note of that uh, and put that forward thank you thank you very much councillor jeff harvey um, yes i um noting from the minutes from the last meeting that i queried um or asked whether there's been any um, progress in organizing a cross-departmental approach to cottage nursery horses which has sort of multiple enforcement issues but I noticed this time that it, it's kind of been removed from the um, enforcement report and I wondered is that an oversight or is there a reason why it's disappeared from the report? Yes councillor um, it appears that it will be an oversight uh, for that one obviously there are various and numerous issues um, at that site uh, which I'm dealing with myself personally um, in liaison with other members of the local parish uh, council as well. Um, we've not entered the premises yet. Uh, we are having issues um, on that side of it, um, which may lead to a uh, magistrate warrant. Um, but we're trying to avoid that if we can. Um, but yes, it is being dealt with um, and it's myself. So if you want to contact me directly, then, then please feel free to do so uh, for any updates. Yeah, just come back on that and um, so um, through you chair um, can I assume then that there will be a report in the next uh, enforcement report at the next okay. yes I'll, I'll make sure it's there councillor thank, thank you. you and councillor Dr Tuin Hawkins uh, thank you chair um, two or three things Burwash Manor um, thank you for the update on that one and I'm glad to see there's now an application that has been submitted. Does that just seem to have sat on the um, enforcement list for so long? But at least um, there's um, you know something happening on that. Um, on Smithy Fen, I can tell you, no one is as keen as myself uh, in my official role to see this thing resolved. And it's a shame that uh, criminality um, activities by a handful is causing. Uh, so much concern and being conflated with planning issues. Yes, there might be some planning issues, but I think it's more the criminality that's driving this. So hopefully we can get that uh, properly resolved uh, with this multidisciplinary uh, group. Um, finally, Haydenway Willingham. I think I spied an email that something was happening like there again or had happened in contravention of the um, uh, of the planning conditions. I'm not sure if you saw that from Councillor uh, Bill Handley. I think it was an email on Monday. Please have a look. Yeah, the, that email was to do in relation to digging up outside, which is the utilities uh, company, which we, we don't have any control as a statutory undertaker. 
Okay. I think the, I think the okay. residents were complaining, obviously, that they were digging up part of a grass verge outside of the site uh, and impacting on the highway. Um, unfortunately, there's it's I think it's due to the fibre optic broadband um, that's been installed. We don't have any control over that. Okay. Have the residents been told? Has it been explained to them that it's nothing that we can do anything about? Because otherwise, we're still being pilloried for not taking enforcement action. Yes, I'll be contacting Councillor Bill Handy by email shortly um, on it all. We've just had the, the confirmation from our legal side that we can't take any action um, against it. So Councillor Handy will be updated. Okay, thank you. I think in this case, is a lot of the time, it's just simple communications with those who are, you know, who are raising the concerns so they can understand what we are able to do by law and what, we, <laughs> and what is beyond you know, um, what the law allows us to do. Thank you. I know, I completely agree, Councillor. Thank you, and thank you very much. And just, I think, you know, everybody, we really respect all the work. It's very, very complex, difficult work you, you do, and really important to people's lives. So thank you very much. No, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Um, and members, we go on to agenda item 12, which is appeals. And I have asked Nigel also to give us a bit of an update. Not Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so you'll note from the, um, the appeals table that um, unusually we've had five um, allowed decisions and three dismissed. Um, I was just going to talk briefly about two of the um, allowed decisions. So firstly, the, um, the Linton drainage condition. Um, so the inspector the inspector there, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure members of you are fully aware of this one. Um, so the, the inspector there said that he noted that, um, that a drainage scheme was submitted to the local legal authority who didn't raise any concerns. Um, and they said that subject to the drainage system being appraised by the Environment Agency. So following the submission of the appeal, the appellant undertook some testing, some borehole testing. That information went to the Environment Agency and they were, were happy with it. And, and essentially the inspector said that um, uh, because of the, the support from the Environment Agency and the local League flood authority that, um, that the appeal should be allowed. Um, so I don't know if you have any questions on that one. Uh, I do, not on that particular uh, condition, but on that particular site. I noticed one of the conditions, the landscaping was dismissed. Um, I think it'd be useful uh, to know what exactly that means in terms of what the uh, developer is now actually allowed to, to build out. From what I understand, they're allowed to build up to foundation level, but it'd be interesting to know, given landscaping, it relates predominantly to, to layout. Um, it would be useful to know what exactly the developer is and isn't allowed to do at this stage, because there is some local concern that they're not adhering to what they are allowed to do. Okay, I'd have to take that away and have a, have a look at it. I mean, clearly they need to re-discharge the landscaping details. Um, um, and, the, and all of the triggers in that condition still apply. But I'm, I will investigate that uh, and let, let you know an answer to that. Any other questions? No, you said that was two of you. There was another one. The other one I wanted to, to look at was um, the Apple Acre. So, it, again, members, I think you may be familiar with this, but um, this was, uh, there, were, there were two applications to um, remove conditions from two parcels of land and the conditions said the site shall not be used other than as a touring caravan site and shall not be occupied by mobile homes used either for seasonal use or permanent residential accommodation. And there had been an appeal, um, a dismissed appeal in 2018. Uh, essentially, the inspector um, gave little weight to the appeal because there'd been a change in circumstances where a lawful development certificate had been uh, granted by the council um, stating that touring caravans can be permanently occupied all year round and the inspector gave great weight to that and um, decided that the, the two conditions should be removed from the consent, which essentially means that um, they can uh, occupy the site permanently. Um, but the numbers, uh, he, he, uh, he kept the, the conditions limiting the numbers to 15 on site A and five on site B. Um, in, in consents. So I don't know if you've got any questions about that one. Um, 
just going through my head now. So by granting that, uh, what do you call it, lawful, lawful grounds? Okay. okay, we cannot shoot ourselves in the foot. Is that what? Is that um, what it's like that. <laughs> you could you could look at it that way, but but um, but uh, what I would say is Job lawful development. Yes, yeah. Minister. Yes, Minister. Um, the lawful <laughs> development certificate is based purely on evidence. So the council had evidence. Um, it's based on the balanced probability of evidence. So it's not looking at planning merits. It is only looking at what does the evidence um, on the balanced probability suggest. And clearly, we had we were we were um, satisfied. That on the balance of probability, the evidence suggested that there had been um, a, a permanent occupation, and therefore we didn't have any enforcement powers, so we granted the certificate. Yeah. Okay, so taking that forward, that means we should have given more weight to that lawful certificate that we gave. I would, I would say yes. Yeah. No, that's why it's all we, so we can learn, it's learning, yeah, and don't make you know the yes. same mistake again, yes. or rather learn how to do our balancing <laughs> better. Okay, thank you. The other, the other matter I wanted to raise. Oh. Um, just to add, and it's, uh, unfortunately it's not on Appendix 3, so we've had two recent uh, appeal hearings, one for a uh, site, Mill Lane Sawston scheme of 30 dwellings and a scheme of 40 dwellings, so we're awaiting the decision on that, but I can't predict when that's likely to be forthcoming. Uh, and the other one is a site at New Road over uh, where the appeal was a couple of weeks ago. And again, we're awaiting the uh, the decision on that one. Councillor Peter Fain. Do you want the microphone? There was due to be a, a hearing on an appeal against the refusal of a retirement village in Stapleford. Uh, that hearing was due to start yesterday. I don't know whether that is going ahead or whether... That's page 149. Oh, I missed it. Okay. Oh, I haven't got page 149. Speak you, Chair. That, that's correct. There's a, it's a public inquiry and that, um, that started yesterday and it's right. scheduled for eight days. Yes. Councillor Williams. Thank you. Um, Mr. Reid has, has summarised for us um, my request from last time. If we could have it in the report because... I did request at the last meeting that those ones, because obviously they sort of drop off and then eventually we get decision notice, so it's hard to track where we're at with things. So if we, uh, thank you for the update, if we could have a chart in the report still. Um, and just on the horse and groom, um, at, uh, it says it's, it says it's on it's Stephen Warden, which it is, but it's, it's a very odd place in which you could literally have a drink in that pub in two different parishes. One end is in Stephen Warden, and the other end is Littlington, because the parish boundary went straight through the bar. Um, so, so yes. It, but I have to say that this site has had more planning permissions than um, than probably meetings that you know I've attended at, at this council, and that's that's in the hundreds. Um, so, I, I I do hope that we will be pushing back quite sternly on, on, on defending the decision that you've taken on it on the basis that I mean we have literally given permission for so much this is the odd thing that they've that's been classed as not suitable um, you know they just need to use one of the permissions they've already got in my view as I'm sure Nigel will agree with we will robustly defend oh, the always, appeal, as always. Uh, for, as always, indeed. Thank you very much. That's It'd be fine. a shame to lose the uh, Simpsons graffiti over this. Okay. Um, I just had one more thing, which is, it's not on the agenda, but I thought it might be useful to update you about, um, and that is um, the current sort of position with judicial reviews. So we've, um, you, you'll recall uh, considering the Duxford Imperial War Museum Hotel application, um, and uh, um, papers were lodged for judicial review on that, on the basis that um, the, the allegation was that we had, had improperly considered policy E7, which is the special policy related to the Duxford Imperial War Museum, in, in that we had not adequately considered the need for the scale of hotel that was proposed. Um, 
we, ident we, we, we said that um, there is well, there's no requirement within the policy to, to justify the scale of the, of the proposal. Um, and the application for permission to apply for a judicial review was refused. So there is a period of seven days to challenge, but um, it's just that's recently come through. Um, and that's on top of the two, two uh, others this year and Fuse Lane. Um, one of those um, was, uh, was unsuccessfully challenged and one is subject to challenge. Is that correct? So it's kind of 3 nil at the moment for, for the council in, uh, in judicial review proceedings. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Nigel. I think it is really important for this to be recognised. So we, we often, from the planning service, often get a lot of flack and, and even planning committee decisions, it's really important for us to know where they sound, you know, if they go to appeal and have an analysis of that, not just a little, it's there. And, and I think three nil, what I understand is costs were awarded on the Duxford. That's correct, Chair. Yes. Which is a huge thing. So not only was it, but costs awarded means that you have to have had a very robust defence of it. And also on the Fuse Lane costs That's were correct also awarded. Well, yeah. So it's, it's, I think this, you know, it's not great to have judicial reviews. But it is important to be able to, for us to know, and I think for others to know, that those have been um, won so far. Councillor Dr. Tim Hall, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was going to talk about the um, costs that were awarded, especially with the Fuse Lane one. Um, and I think, you know, just to reiterate, it is good to know that the decisions that we are making um, are being upheld, and where they're not, you know, we need to learn the lessons from exactly. them. But this is good that, you know, with the JRs, Okay, thank you. Thank you, members. Thank you, everybody, for applying. Thank you for anybody who's still with us online and to all of the planning officers as well. And have a good rest of the day.